Okay, uh, good morning to everyone. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all our participants, to all of you who actually came to Vienna, and to our two speakers who are going to join us later on over Zoom from France. Uh, I'd like to also thank all our online audience and um, everyone who was interested in uh, today's event. Now, um, the conference today, you, um, Byzantium and the Origins of Eurasia, is um, part of the events we organize as part of the Eurasia in Global Dialogue program at the Institute of Human Sciences in Vienna. Uh, I'm the coordinator of the program, and quite a lot of our participants today uh, our speakers are close friends of the Institute. I, I like to think of them like that because they've been coming over the years. Uh, the newcomers, as you will find out, I think, based on experience, will be drawn in at one stage as well. So um, I just want to give you a little bit of an idea of how um, we came up uh, with the idea of this conference. Uh, so. Um, a year ago, more than a year ago, before uh, the coronavirus <laughs> crisis started, uh, we had uh, Professor Sergei Ivanov uh, as a fellow at our institute. And, you know, because I always like to take uh, full use of people, and I thought that, of course, he's such a well-known um, scholar in our field, that it would be great to actually take advantage of him being here with us in Vienna. And so in, in some ways, he's the pretext for, for this conference. Uh, later on, as you know, we needed to, to put off. We put off several times. And then uh, I uh, decided to have the conference now because it could tie in with the visit of one of our other fellows, Professor Valentina Izmirleva. Uh, and in this way, we sort of uh, decided on this date. I would just, <laughs> Professor Lido, welcome. Um, I would just like to tell you a few words uh, about the concept of the conference. It's very simple, really. I think that it is the natural habit of anyone who is trained in history to um, look for a historical explanation of phenomena. So, when we think about, you know, a lot of the um, events, aspects of culture nowadays, or in the modern period, as historians, we naturally tend to look at their history in order to understand anything now. In order to understand who we are, we need to go back in history in order to see where we come from. And I think that there are certain aspects of culture, of politics, of religion that we cannot even begin to understand unless we look at their historical genealogy. So this is one of the ideas is to have this sort of long durée approach to what's been going on in Eurasia. Uh, it so happened that we have a focus on Russia, but not only, as you will see. Um, so this is the first idea. The second idea is, to put it very simply, without Byzantium, uh, it wouldn't be an exaggeration in a certain sense of the word to say that without Byzantium, there wouldn't have been Eurasia. And this is not my idea. It's something that has been coming up in a modern history. And I think that, for me, it's been interesting to think about this idea of coming uh, up in two different variants. So, during the Enlightenment, I think that Voltaire probably summarizes this notion uh, in, in a very good way when he said that for him Byzantine history was a disgrace for the human mind. It was nothing more than a worthless collection of declamations and miracles. And then you see Hegel saying it's a disgusting picture of imbecility and so on and so forth. And 
Of course, from this tradition of thought, you have this implication and this notion that, you know, what has been happening in the Eurasian uh, region, and so far as you see it in a negative light, you know, this can be explained as all these societies and cultures being the heirs of Byzantium. This is why they're doing badly, because you see they come out of this tradition. And then you see how, in a way, this whole thinking has been turned around, was turned around in the 19th century in Russia. And you have people like Konstantin Leontiev, who actually thought that Byzantium being different from Western Europe was a great thing, because it presented an alternative to Western liberalism. And I think that, you know, now, in a way, I'm thinking of our conference as not going one way or the other way, but you have an I ideas from the Enlightenment, you have a 19th century reaction from Russia. And now we're looking at this whole uh, history from Byzantium to modern Eurasia from the point of view of, you know, scholars in the 21st century. So, um, I'd like to think of the, the papers that we'll hear today as case studies of what I just said, of this theoretical framework. And also, I think that to me it makes uh, sense. I've read only the abstracts, but I, I thought about the papers as uh, stories. Stories that look at events and developments in Eurasia and uh, they don't conceive of these developments as just happening to occur in Eurasia, but Eurasia itself shapes them in a certain way, in an active way. So um, I'll now give the floor to our keynote speaker, uh, Professor Sergei Ivanov. So uh, please, the floor is yours. Oh, sorry, Professor Ivanov. I'm very sorry. I have to present you very quickly. I, 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 I forgot about that because I just felt very stupid because everybody here knows you so well. But I'll do it very, very quickly. So uh, Professor Ivanov is the chair of ancient and Byzantine history uh, at the National Research University, High School of Economics in Moscow. Uh, he's a close friend of uh, the Institute in Vienna. He's been several times here as our fellow. Uh, he's very well known to all of us in the field. He's written more than 200 scholarly publications. I'll just cite a few of them. The Russian translation and commentaries to Leo the Deacon's history in 1988, uh, the two volume corpus of the oldest written evidence on the Slavs, 1991 to 1995, and the fate of the Cyrilo Methodian tradition after Cyril and Methodius, which was published, it, it's a co authored book in 2001. I think that probably some of his most famous uh, monographs are The Holy, Fo uh, Holy Fools in Byzantium and Beyond, Pearls Before Swine, Byzantine Missionary Work. The collection of articles, Byzantine culture and hagiography, and a book which has been translated in many languages in uh, Eastern Europe and uh, in the West, In Search of Constantinople, the Guide to Byzantine Istanbul. So, uh, please, Sergei Ivanov. Thank you, Clemena. Um, I decided to, ah, the, the title to narrow my topic a little bit. This is the proper title is here. So let me begin with reminding you that both names that feature in the title of our conference, Byzantium and Eurasia, are misleading. Well, the notion Byzantium is in fact much larger than its etymon. The notion of, notion of Eurasia is much smaller. The name of a tiny ancient polis was stretched to cover the whole empire that occupied for some time all of, east of the East Mediterranean. On the other hand, Eurasia is the name of the largest continent on Earth, 
but in the sense in which it is discussed normally in relation to Russia, has nothing to do with the vast majority of these continent's regions, neither with India, nor with China, nor with Arab world, or with, nor with Japan, nor with Western or Central Europe for that matter. Eurasia is in mentioned in relation to Russia. Deals with only one comparatively modest problem of the cohabitation of the Eastern Slavs with Turkic and Mongolian peoples. The artificial term Byzantium irritates many scholars who claim that it imposes a separation of the medieval Roman Empire from the ancient one. The artificial term Eurasia, though geographically correct, is still problematic since it's imp it imposes a commonality upon the cultures that are so obviously different. The appearance of these two terms side by side causes yet another problem. By the moment when Byzantium perished, the term Eurasia had to wait for another 400 years to be invented. Besides, while both words that constituted Europe and Asia already existed, of course, they did not have the same overtones of meaning that they have today. The Byzantines did not regard Europe as something culturally prestigious, nor did they have any contempt towards Asia as a symbol of something dangerous or unclean. To the opposite, uh, to the contrary, uh, Jerusalem is in the east. Paradise, for that matter, is in the east. For the Byzantines, all aliens, both European and Asian, were mere barbarians. So it makes no sense to ask whether Byzantium real Byzantium was a European or an Oriental civilization, since both terms are anachronistic. Rus and later, um, hmm? does it work? Can I switch it? No. Oh, oh, oh. oh that's it. No, 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 that's it. So Rus and later Russia existed in, in everlasting dialogue with Byzantium. What you see on the screen is in, just try to guess what it is, uh, is an artifact found two years ago during the excavations on Kirillovska Street in <coughs> Kiev. It is a semi-product of a Rus counterfeiter of the 11th century. Uh, so uh, the author tried to falsify a Byzantine nomisma. He was trying to imitate a genuine Byzantine coin and was practicing it in depicting the image of an emperor. There are three of them on, <laughs> on this piece, as you can uh, see. However hard he tried, he could never achieve the perfection of the imperial nomisma. This abortive attempt to reproduce the Byzantine image of imperial might is a forceful metaphor. It makes little sense to ask how much Russia resembled Byzantium in reality. What matters is who in Russia, when, in what proportion, and with what goals tried to imitate Byzantium. My today's question is how the defunct, no longer existing Byzantium was perceived in modern Russia which had already borrowed from the West the view of Europe as something good, uh, and the notion of Europeanness began to shape the perception of the past. I will speak only of the way Byzantium was evaluated and re-evaluated in Russia, and even more precisely, I'm interested whether Russia regarded this imaginary Byzantium as the West or the East, as Europe or as Orient. And uh, I will concentrate on several episodes of this prolonged discussion. The first of the so is the so-called Greek project of the Empress Catherine the Great. After an extremely successful war against the Ottoman Empire in 1768-1774, uh, the Russian government decided that the time was ripe, ripe for planning the dismemberment of the eternal enemy. The question was what to do with the territories which will be snatched away from the Turks. 
The swift and uh, unopposed eastward expansion of Russia inspired a plan for a similar southward expansion. Yet, Catherine realized that moving towards and through the Balkans, she would enter the territories with an old tradition of independent statehood, and this demanded a more nuanced approach. In May 1779, a second grandson was born to the empress. The first one to the, le to the left is Alexander, the future emperor Alexander I. To the right is his, her second uh, grandson. She gave him the meaningful name Constantine, and as you see here, he's holding the so-called cross of Constantine the Great. Um, and she did not conceal from the Western ambassadors invited to the baptism ceremony that the newborn baby was destined to become the emperor of the future reborn Byzantine Empire. This is the coin um, uh, minted on this occasion. You see the, um, the church, the cathedral of uh, St. Sophia, the background. Since there was no public opinion or independent press in the 18th century Russia, the foreign diplomats' reports and the correspondence among European rulers are our main source of knowledge about the Russian government's plans. Even the very term Greek project was coined by the British ambassador to Russia, yet this term was indeed apt. The sumptuous festivities that accompanied this birth were old fashioned in a so-called Greek style. The choirs were singing songs in ancient Greek language. A wet nurse found for the baby was a Greek woman renamed for the occasion from the original real name Sultana to Helena, since such was the name of the Emperor Constantine the Great's mother. So Prince Constantine was to be imbued with Greek spirit literally from the cradle. Soon the Greek project acquired a diplomatic and military foundation in the form of Russia's secret treaty with the Austrian Empire, uh, in which the resuscitation of Byzantium was included as part of the future rearrangement of the Balkans after the Allies expected triumph over the Ottomans. Prince Constantine was to reign in the new old empire with his throne established in Constantinople. The ensuing 15 years of the Russian foreign and interior policy passed in the shadow of the Greek project. Yet, this project concerns us now only in as much it can re reveal to us how Catherine the Great perceived Byzantium in her personal encounters with the Austrian Emperor Joseph II uh, in uh, 1780 in Mogilev. As he himself wrote in his letters, Catherine time and again asked him why he didn't seize Rome if he was a Holy Roman Emperor. Joseph each time sarcastically retorted that he was not interested in Rome, but that he understood why she raised this question and that if she wanted, she might take Constantinople. According to Joseph, the Empress each time pretended to be embarrassed as if caught in flagrante delicto, but she still, time and again, returned to the question of Rome and both emperors laughed out loud. Uh, that's what uh, Joseph wrote. What was the meaning of this strange game between two august persons? Obviously, both of them had in mind Rome, a Roman Empire. So Catherine showed that she was the heiress of the Eastern Rome to the same extent that Joseph had the right to inherit the Western Rome. But in both cases, the concept of Rome was at the center of the discourse. It turns out that Catherine's Byzantium was not in the least an Orthodox Christian society. She mocked the very idea that Constantine would become, as she put it contemptuously in French, prestolet, it is priestling. She also mocked the Byzantine custom of men wearing a beard as a universal sign of manliness. You see Constantine, of course, it's impossible to, to imagine him with a beard. Um, when she decided to erect a church of St. Sophia near her re residence at the outskirts of St. Petersburg, her court architect, Charles Cameron, made a maquette that resembled the great cathedral of Justinian. Yet it turned out not to be to Catherine's liking. She had in mind a much more classic classicist design. As a result, 
a modest church still existing today has nearly nothing in common with its famous namesake at the Bosphorus. Numerous Byzantine carnivals and feasts in St. Petersburg displayed neither Byzantium, of which the Russian court knew virtually nothing, nor even the Greek antiquity. It was all about Roman stylization. It was inhabited by Roman gods, Mars, Minerva, Venus, and not by Ares, Athena, or Aphrodite. Catherine herself was a strict writer, and her pen served her political de designs. In 1786, she wrote a play, Oleg, in which she describes the siege put on Constantinople by the Kievan prince Oleg in 907. According to this play, after the Byzantine Emperor Leo VI surrendered and the peace treaty was signed, Oleg expressed his will to enter Constantinople because his, his cherished desire, it turns out, has, had always been to attend the Greek theater and see a Euripides play, believe it or not. Um, moreover, the Emperor Leo entertains Oleg with the spectacle of athletic competition, which, as the Empress Zoe explains to Oleg, uh, were introduced to Greece by the Romans. You see now the um, stage settings of the, uh, of the real show in, uh, eight, in 1790. Um, this is Oleg, and uh, uh, once, on, once again, believe it or not, this is Constantinople. Mm, uh, uh, this, uh, um, uh, this is, um, this is Ale Oleg with his famous shield. This is uh, the Emperor Leo VI, uh, a real uh, a Roman consul. And this is the Empress, Empress Zoe, and these are the B Byzantine troops. So look at this Constantinople as she visualized it. Uh, the Greek project proved unrealistic after Catherine's second unsuccessful war with the Ottomans in 1789-91. What is important for us, however, is that for the Empress, Byzantium looked like a second edition of ancient Greece with a considerable, considerable proportion of Roman additions. It is not by chance that side by side with the Greek empire, the second artificial state provisioned by Catherine for the Balkan, for the Northern Balkans, was labeled in her documents with the Latin name Dacia, Dacia. And one of the fortresses she found on the Black Sea coast got the name Ovidiopolis, so for Tsarina, Russians, uh, Russia's Byzantine legacy was her country's pass to the West, into the Roman world. Let us fast forward to 1828. After the defeat of the Decembrists' revolt, Alexander Pushkin, to the dismay of his liberal friends, wrote a poem, Stances, with a eulogy for the new emperor, Nicholas I. In response to this step, another poet, Pavel Katinin, whom Pushkin deemed his own teacher, wrote and sent to Pushkin his own poem, Stare Byl, The Old Tale. The action takes place at the court of Prince Vladimir and his new wife, the Byzantine Princess Anna. The prince announces a poetry contest between the Greeks from the prince's retinue and the Russians. On the Byzantine side, we see a subtle castrato whose song is a panegyric to the Constantinopolitan autocracy. In a florid description which shows mm, that Katenian uh, attentively read uh, sources, the castrato um, is marveling at the golden lions who sit at, on both sides of the emperor's throne. Uh, then he sings on behalf of the golden birds sitting on the branches of a silver tree that stands near the same throne. And I quote, we, that is the golden birds, are a hundred times happier than the living birds. What does their seeming freedom mean if there exist arrows and snares? They live in forests and fields. They have to endure heat and frost, while we, in our blessed servitude, enjoy a multitude of luxuries, end of quote. The castrato flatters Vladimir as a junior member of the imperial family. And finally, the prince orders the R Russian competitor, a robust bard not used to court intricacies, to refuse 
from competition and admit his defeat. In this poem, all analogies are obvious. The Russian bard is Katenin himself. The Byzantine castrator is Pushkin. And the court of Constantinople is the Petersburg autocracy. In such a framework, Byzantium embodies the hated despotic Orient with its complicated court ceremonial and its castratos. Pushkin felt mortally offended. For him, as for all his social circle, Byzantium was something despised. All of them in this circle read Gibbon in French translation and knew that Byzantium was a civilizational catastrophe and any comparison with it was an insult. In this respect, Pushkin did not differ from his ideological adversary, Pyotr Chiadaev, with his famous and tragic philosophic letter in which he bitterly resented that Russia had chosen the Byzantine path, leading it away from Europe. Let's, let us skip another 30 years. The intellectual movement of Slavophiles in the 1850s had a very complicated attitude towards Byzantium. Constantinople had never been a Slavic city, and yet it looked as a token of the pan-Slavic unity. The great Russian poet Fyodor Tychev wrote in, in 1854 in a poem entitled The Prophecy, I quote, the St. Sophia's ancient vaults will once more house Christ's altar in the restored Byzantium. Do fall before it, O Tsar of Russia, and rise as Tsar of all the Slavs. End of quote. Nobody could explain why, in order to become a Tsar of all Slavs, including Catholic Poles, Protestant Moravians or Muslim Bosnians, the Russian emperor was invited to prostrate himself before the altar of Hagia Sophia. But for us now, it's important to emphasize that in this context, Byzantium again played a European role, although this role was not a westernizing one. Yet to prostrate in San Sofia, the Russian Tsar first had to conquer Constantinople and all such hopes perished after Russian, Russia had lost the Crimean War in 1856. This humiliating defeat once again pushed the pendulum of the Byzantine image eastward. This happened in two forms. The first one was a sort of childish ressentiment. In 1859, the governor of the Russian Far East, Count Nikolai Muravyov, founded a new city at the farther, farthest southeast of the vast Russian Empire on the confines of the Chinese and Korean territories across a narrow strait from Japan. Muravyov, uh, on the screen, uh, named the city Vladivostok, hold the east. But what is of importance for us? He also gave new names to the Gulf, at whose shores the foundation for the new city were laid, and to the strait flowing to the city, Sea of Japan. The Gulf was baptized, baptized Golden Horn, and this street plaque you see, it's, it's uh, one month ago taken picture. While the strait was named the Bosphorus of the East, this was and still remains the east, easternmost part of Eurasia, which reminds of Byzantium. Muravyov le left no memoranda that would explain such toponymics, but we can surmise that the concept behind it came down to the idea that since Russia failed to obtain the old Byzantium, we will install a new one of our own. Later on, there came a more meaningful response from Konstantin Leontiev in his famous pamphlet, Byzantism, Byzantism and Slavdom, uh, 1875. In that book, he bid farewell to the Slavophile concept and declared that Russia should forget about the Slavs, even the Orthodox Christian ones, and should instead become Byzantium itself. It Leo in Leontiev's dream, Byzantium turned into a purely Oriental stronghold of despotism. Uh, Leontiev unabashedly confessed that his sympathies were on the side of 
Xerxes, the king of Persia, not on that of the ancient Greeks who defended their freedom against him. The Byzantinization of Russia, according to Leontiev, was to become a vaccine against West Westernization, which was to him a synonym of moral decay and cultural mess. Leontiev fiercely criticized what he called the pink Christianity, like that of Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, and insisted that the real Byzantine Christianity was a harsh and gloomy religion of repression and submission. This oriental trend was instantly recognized by the Russian intellectuals. Leontiev and his idea of Byzantinization slash orientalization ignited a heated public debate. One of his opponents, Vladimir Solovyov, responded with the poem Ex Orienta Lux, 1890, which ended with the following lines. I quote, O Rus, which kind of Orient you want to become? The Orient of Xerxes or the Orient of Christ? End of quote. The underpinning of the dilemma was that Christ's East, it is Christian East, was in fact not East at all, while the real East was that of Xerxes, it is the, of, uh, of extreme brutality and contempt for human life. Meanwhile, after the successful Russian-Turkish War of 1877-78, the debates around Byzantine heritage became more intense, intense and engulfed all the intellectual circles of Russia. Mm, the visual embodiment of this is, uh, well, there are many things. For example, these are the drafts my, by the famous painter Mikhail Vrubil. Uh, he, he is painting an icon of, uh, of jo John the Forerunner, but in fact, of course, it looks like something very ancient Greek. Mm, and uh, this is his draft of angels, which also look very, uh, uh, well, or original and not um, uh, not traditional, uh, but uh, w w which is w which is more pro um, prominent for us is the architectural style, um, so-called pseudo-Byzantine style, um, uh, which culminated in the Mar Maritime Cathedral uh, in Kronstadt uh, before you designed as an enlarged copy of Saint Sophia of Constantinople. Uh, I'm not in the, uh, an art historian and therefore not in the position to judge to what extent this style was orientalizing the Byzantine prototype or westernizing it. But suffice it to say that in Russia at the turn of the 20th century, it became impossible not to think of mm, Byzantium, especially since the public atmosphere was filled with foreboding of tectonic upheavals. And needless to say, these sentiments grew truly obsessive in the at the outbreak of the First World War, when the prospect of finally conquering Constantinople became very real. But let us turn to our topic. In autumn of 1917, uh, when the familiar old world was exploded by the Bolshevik Revolution, a prominent poet of the Russian Silver Age, Nikolai Gumilov, suddenly began writing a play set in, uh, uh, excuse me, I'm, I'm showing you different different views of um, the Maritime Cathedral. You see, it's absolutely grandiose and was uh, recently restored. Uh, it's really something uh, absolutely grandiose. Mm. So, Nikolai Glumyov. Uh, began, he began writing a play set in Byzantium. One could hardly think of anything more distant from the present day, day concerns. Yet in 1918, Gumilov doggedly kept, kept writing his play, which he titled The Poisoned Tunic. The plot is partially based on a historical fact. In the sixth century, the Arab prince Imr al-Qais, who lost a power strife for his princedom, came to Constantinople and asked Justinian for military assistance to regain his throne on a distant Arabic peninsula. The reason behind this plot becomes more understandable if we take into consideration the life circumstances of Gumilov himself. In 1917-18, he served as a Russian liaison officer at the Entente General Staff in Paris, 
After the Russian Revolution, many Russians in Paris undoubtedly shared a forceful desire to ask the Allies for military aid against the Bolsheviks. By the way, Gumilev found this impulse undignified and even chose to return to Russia on his own will, exactly when millions of his compatriots were fleeing from it. He was promptly executed by the Bolsheviks. However, it's not Gumilev's sad fate that interests us here, but his view of Byzantium. So for him, Constantinople stands definitely for Paris, and the empire of Justinian is certainly the West, which is infinitely far from and superior to the backwater Arabia, by which Russia is implied. But the very atmosphere of Constantinople is poisoned. In Gumilov's play, the Empress Theodora, herself allegedly from the East, um, says to the princess, this is Theodora from a recent uh, staging of the, of the play, says to the princess Zoe, a fictitious daughter of Justinian, and I quote, you are from the ancient Roman blood, all fil filth of palaces, all vices of your ancestors, all betrayals and baseness of Byzantium is concentrated in you. You are like a flower which grew up on a plug cemetery. You think you are a woman, but in, fa <coughs> but in fact, you are a poisoned bridal tunic. You, your every step is death. Your every glance is death. Your every touch is deadly." End of quote. In Gumilov's play, Imr al kais is a poet. Uh, he, uh, from the same, <coughs> from the same play, uh, uh, he is the only character who's in the play who speaks in rhyme, while poetry is alien to Byzantium, that is, to the West. In the atmosphere of total collapse of habitual forms, states, and ways of life, Many people in Russia were inclined to blame Byzantium for the catastrophe that befell their country. Such was the attitude of the religious philosopher Sergei Bulgakov, who uh, in 1922 mm, repeats Chadaev's assertion that the Oriental Byzantium tore Russia away from the civilized West and thus facilitated the revolution. The most exotic point of view was expressed by the painter and poet Maximilian Voloshin in his poem Europe, written in the fateful and ominous 1918. For him, Byzantium is certainly Europe. Moreover, visualizing Europe as a female body, he writes in a risque and forceful metaphor that Bosphorus was Europe's vagina and the protruding peninsula of Constantinople, its clitoris, by which Europe was seducing the barbaric nations, uh, including the simple-hearted Slavs. But Byzantium was finally raped by Islam and subdued by Asia. Since our conference is dedicated to Eurasia, it would be unfair not to mention the influential school of thought among the Russian white emigration, which labeled itself Eurasianism. You see its uh, founding father, uh, Prince Nikolai Trubetskoy. Um, the Eurasianist teaching was that Russia tried too assiduously to become the West, thus disregarding the great role that the East, in, part, in particular the Mongol and Turkic peoples, had played in its history. Russia's troubles, therefore, were caused by Russia's failure to understand its own dual Eurasian nature and to shape itself in the correct way. In the Eurasianist framework, not only Byzantine, but also ancient Greek culture was of Eurasian nature. It comes as, as a surprise, since it's a contradiction uh, uh, to the main point of the Eurasianists that Eurasia is defined by the lack of any sea nearby. Uh, so for, the, for, for them, for reasons unknown, both um, ancient Greece and Byzantium were um, uh, well, mainland culture, uh, civilizations. For the Bolsheviks, on the other hand, Byzantium was a symbol of things religious, religious, obscurantist, and oriental. Demyan Biedny, one of the staunchest defenders of the class-based attitude to history, said in 1936, I quote, Byzantium gave us the most vicious form of Christianity. Byzantinism 
was worse than the Tatar yoke. It tore us away from the progressive West. Progressive West, said the Bolshevik, uh, Bolshevik um, Biedny. With, with this baptism, we got the Orient. We turned our backs to the West. So for the Bolsheviks, the West was something good and the East was something bad, strange as it may seem, end of quote. Let us now skip another 50 years. In 1986, the great emigre poet Joseph Brodsky visited Istanbul and wrote one of his most venomous essays, Flight from Byzantium. The title is, of course, a reversal of the William Yeats famous poem, Sailing to Byzantium. And its emphasis is the repudiation of Yeats' enchantment with the Byzantine art. Brodsky's text is imbued with most ardent hatred towards everything Byzantine and everything Turkish, but the zest of it is Brodsky's hatred of the Orient in general. In his opinion, Byzantium belonged to the Orient to the same extent as Turkey did. The most astounding generalizations, the most risky analogies, everything is used in this essay to show the Oriental character of Byzantium, but of course, Byzantium here is a mere camouflage. Brodsky seeks to condemn the Soviet Union as an Asiatic despotism that he regarded as Byzantine legacy and therefore eternal and immutable. Ironically, when this essay was published, that despotism was already doomed and five years later it ceased to exist. Uh, we saw that the ideas about the Asian or European nature of Byzantium were very strong and very polarized in the Russian society. This is only natural for a debate in which people operate with abstract notions lacking any real substance. The participants of these debates knew virtually nothing about Byzantium. The less the knowledge, the more heated the debate. I have intentionally left out the names that are most frequently associated in today's Russia with the Byzantine debates, like Tikhon Shevkunov <coughs> or Alexander Dugin. In, in recent years, I have been talking about them, them too much and I'm tired of them. <laughs> Um, so I will finish my uh, list of prominent Russians who expressed their opinion on whether Byzantium was the East or the West with the name of Sergei Haruji. He passed away last year. Haruji was an uh, the academic physicist, a professional translator of James Joyce into Russian and a professional philosopher. But he got the most acclaim for his attempt to breathe new life into Kesikazm. That, uh, that is, into a mystical tradition of late Byzantium. Traditionally, Gesichasm is brought up by those who want to emphasize the non-Western nature of Byzantine civilization. In general, Gesichasm in today's Russia is a code word of anything anti-liberal, anti-Western, and anti-rational. Haruji was a unique person to develop Esichasm with the help of French philosophy and psychoanalysis. He was a, a unique person uh, insisting that one could admire Byzantine ethicism and loathe Byzantine autocracy. He was unique in denying and uh, the very distinction of East and West as applied to Byzantium. But this is why exactly his ideas cannot gain popularity. They are too complicated to be reduced to a meme. As I said, the pseudo-Byzantine architectural style of the turn of the 20th century tried to look genuinely Byzantine, uh, for better or for worse. One of the examples of this style is St. Vladimir's Cathedral erected in 1891 in Khersonesis, among the very ruins of the Byzantine city in Crimea, which were where Prince Vladimir is believed to have got his baptism in the year 987. The erection of this cathedral virtually, absolutely, literally among the ruins. And, um, uh, of course, uh, of course um, symbolized the Russian imperial aspiration of the turn of the 20th century. After the annexation of Crimea to Russia in 2014, President Putin visited Khersonesis and gave orders to turn it into a site of national pilgrimage. In his solemn address, 
to the Federal Assembly in December of 2014. He compared its significance for the Russia with the significance of the Temple Mountain in Jerusalem for the Jews. A month ago, digital vis visualization of the Byzantine theme park to be erected in Hersonesis and imitating the Byzantine city was leaked online. Uh, the protests of professional archaeologists aside, this non yet fulfilled wet dream of the Kremlin ideologists look very Western, much more Western than the pseudo Byzantine style of 100 years earlier. As you see, it's an style, stylized as an ancient city. No, further. Um, probably, uh, in all likelihood, this image was intimated by the public perception of Byzantium, as rendered, for example, in this popular uh, animated cartoon um, of uh, 2018. Uh, it's, you cannot see well, but on the, uh, on the backdrop there are um, fantastic, rec uh, fantastic, fanta fantastic buildings which resemble uh, southern Italy, probably, but definitely not Byzantium. So after two centuries of meandering, Russia returns to the European image of Byzantium characteristic of Catherine the Great. As we saw, the perception of Byzantium as the East or as the West depended on what Russian observers thought of Russia proper, of its fate and destiny. I began my talk to the sound of Greek choirs. I will finish it to the sound of explosions and machine gun fire. In May 2014, guerrilla forces of the East approached Constantinople from the southern direction and were 20 kilometers away from it when they were finally thrown back. More than a year later, in June 2015, they resumed their offensive, this time directly from the East, after, heavy, after fighting, a heavy fighting broke out 39 kilometers away from Constantinople and lasted for a week uh, with the use of uh, uh, well, heavy artillery and tanks. But uh, the forces of the West finally stopped the enemy and the front line stabilized. Constantinople remained on the Western side of the dividing line. What I just told you is neither a fantasy nor an, ex an exercise in alternative history. It's a real combat report from the recent civil war in Donbass in eastern Ukraine. Uh, this, is the, this is the map of the, so uh, the red uh, are of course the separatist regions and the, the interim region is the places of, of the uh, very heavy fighting and I don't, I'm sure if, if it works. No, try again, please. Uh, please try again. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so the very, the, the, yeah, one before last. Uh, it's actually nice to, to look to the picture. Uh, yeah, yeah, no further. Yeah, this one. So, and I don't see, but the pointer doesn't work. Well, you see the, 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 the black circle. This is Constantinople. It, Constantinople is a small village founded in 1779 by Greek colonists in what was then known as Novorossia, the New Russia. Several, uh, here is its it's coat of arms. You see this, uh, you know, dairy production and corns and the meander between them. Uh, I don't know what, uh, what the, uh, the sword stands for. Um, so this is Constantinople. Several dozen kilometers to the south from Constantinople lays another village also established by the Greeks named Vizantia. This place renamed in 1950 Eight as Kluchivoye, that can be translated as the key point, was also approached by the Eastern forces, but also remained on the west of the ceasefire line. This current episode shows 
that the problem of where Byzantium belongs is far from purely academic and remains, in a sense, a key question as well as a highly explosive one. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Ivanov, for this wonderful historical overview of what you call imaginary Byzantium. You know, Byzantium as East and West in uh, Russian perception. So, um, can I open the floor to questions? First of all, any of the speakers? And then if there's anyone from the audience who would ask, like to ask a question, make a comment, criticisms, any thoughts. You know, I was, just, just before uh, anyone wants to formulate that question, I was just thinking while I was listening to your talk that it almost seems to me that we need something like a lexicon of terms in order to explain how Orient is used in all these different connotations. Byzantium is used in all these different connotations. How empire has to do and lies in a way at the heart of defining Eurasia, Byzantium and so on, and the perception of Byzantium in Russia. And, uh, I, I was just thinking that probably one of the things that will come out of this conference is actually to see the whole complexity in which these, these mm -hmm. terms and concepts have been used. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you feel about, mm -hmm. about that. Uh, yes, um, the, uh, uh, the two terms, Byzantium and Eurasia, sitting side by side is highly problematic uh, for me because Eurasia exists as a phenomenon, yeah? Uh, it, it exists, we, we see the continent on the map, it existed forever. Whereas Byzantium is noumenon, it's imaginary uh, reality, so which is defined uh, in whatever way a person is in, in, intends to interpret it. And therefore, we should always have in mind that the world, that uh, the notion of Orientalism, which is so popular after 1978, uh, Edward Said's book, um, uh, in spite of all its drawbacks, um, still uh, deals with something geographically concrete. So Orient, we, we can define its borders differently. We can ask whether or not um, Byzantium or Russia or the Balkans are the East, but the East exists in as much geography exists, whereas Byzantinism is a purely opinion. It's due to, to everybody's opinion, and uh, we should always bear this in mind. Yes, yeah. I think that's, that's an interesting insight, and I think it also explains why we all love Byzantium, yeah? Because of these, all these imaginary <laughs> <laughs> dimensions about it, you know? And I, I was also thinking that in a way, having the conference here in Vienna is the right place to have it. You know, as you know that there's Metternich in the 19th century who said that Asia, so the Orient, you know, starts at the Landstrasse, which is one of the big streets here. <laughs> and it shows how actually people can, can think mm -hmm. about, you know, Eurasia East and West in, mm -hmm. you know, different ways, but as you say, it is a very concrete reality, while mm -hmm. the way we've been using the concept of Byzantium is so, so, so varied. And let us not forget but that Joseph II of Austria, Austria-Hungarian Empire, was the closest ally of Catherine the Great yes. in, in, in the project of the restoration of the Byzantine mm -hmm. Empire. Yes, yes. And it, it, it said something. Yeah. <laughs> for, for Austria too. Yeah, that's why we should have more conferences on <laughs> Byzantium in Vienna. That's what I think. Why not? <laughs> uh, Valentina, please. I, I want to turn your proposition on its head and kind of as, as a provocation. Isn't it the other way around that Byzantium is a reality, a historical reality, whereas Eurasia is totally a, a, an imaginary concept? <laughs> Um, and, and on that note, I just, I was uh, absolutely uh, enjoyed and admired your, your 
tour the force across history, but I was wondering why you chose not to talk about the Byzantinists in Russia, uh, because Byzantine scholarship, the actual dealing with the historical reality that was mm -hmm. the NTM is a corrective to all the political and cultural fantasies of, of, mm -hmm. of the empire, is something that um, sets um, Russia mm -hmm. um, apart from a lot of other uh, enlightened, let's say. Uh -huh. Well, I mentioned one, so to say, Byzantinist, that is Edward Gibbon, um, the notorious Gibbon, uh, because he was so influential uh, in, the, in Europe in, in, at large. Uh, I'm not speaking about Byzantinists because I'm speaking about public, the public perception, and Byzantinists are not so influential in, in Russia to be uh, heard by um, by, by the wide audience. Um, you probably know the name of uh, Demetrius Stamatopoulos, um, who, is, uh, who is writing about Byzantinism, Byzantinism versus Orientalism, and among other things, as applied to uh, Konstantin Leontiev and uh, another um, person who thought about the same matters, uh, Ivan Sokolov. And uh, there is a, a, a recent article by him. So he juxtaposes Leontiev to Sokolov. But to my mind, uh, this comparison doesn't work because uh, Ivan Sokolov was a professional Byzantinist, whereas Leontiev knew nothing about Byzantium, nothing, absolutely nothing. And in his, in his famous pamphlet, Byzantism and, and Slavdom, uh, everything is about Slavs, uh, how he hates them. But it's only 15 pages of, uh, of, uh, of stupidities about Byzantium. He, he knew nothing. So it's unfair. In a sense, it's unfair to compare them, the two of them. Meanwhile, <laughs> I have to admit, that my great master, Alexander Kashdan, uh, for one, personally hated Byzantium <laughs> to the same extent, <laughs> to the same extent Joseph Brodsky, Brodsky did. Uh, and I, f uh, it, it took time and effort on my side to free myself inside of my soul, to free myself from this preconception of his. <laughs> yes, in spite of all his trem tremendous knowledge of Byzantium, he repeated time and again that the Soviet co communism is, uh, w was inherited from Byzantium. <laughs> it's, it's so funny. Yeah. So the, the, yeah, the personal preconceptions are more forceful than personal knowledge. Yeah, I must admit. Lemena, <laughs> do you hear us or not? said I am doing your early medieval history. Mm -hmm. It's not your business. Mm -hmm. You will study <laughs> Byzantine, you know, matters. Yeah. Mentioning, so yeah, more, more contemporary <laughs> figures, you know, as you mentioned uh, Haruji towards the end of mm -hmm. your uh, talk, you know, he was supposed to be one of our participants. Mm. I was actually in touch with him a few days before he passed away, as he mm. passed away quite uh, suddenly. So he knew about our conference. He was quite excited to come here. He was supposed mm -hmm. to spend a month in Vienna with us. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's a great loss to, to, to all of us. great loss. And he was, very, yeah, he was very sui generis. He didn't like, was like, uh, unlike anybody else. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, now, oh, yeah. Oh, of course. Uh, if, if we don't have time, then... Oh, there's a question from over there. Oh, hi. <laughs> uh, hello. Uh, can we, uh, Vladimir, did you have a, have a question? Of course. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Please, uh, a short uh, one, you, and after that, we'll for move. A very enlightening uh, uh, presentation. I'm very uh, glad that and you mentioned Sergei Horuzhny. I have also very fond memory. I'm sorry that you uh, skip over uh, Dugin and Shevkunov because you probably know, uh, but we who are, who are coming from out of Russia would like to hear. Uh, the thing, well, my question is, uh, uh, you mentioned a, a list of, uh, of uh, uh, 
Russian thinkers, but not those who are probably perceived as the most important for uh, revival of this Byzantine. I'm, I'm like uh, to, uh, uh, referring to mostly to at the beginning of Florensky, but mostly Florovsky, Lossky, mm -hmm. uh, Mayan, Dorschmemann, and this Russian emigration. Do they play mm -hmm. a part in Russian intellectual debate about Byzantium, or they are like a sort of uh, different strand of... Sorry, of sorry to interrupt, Professor Ivanov. Can I ask you for a very short answer? <laughs> <laughs> the very short answer is that uh, Meindorf's book, for example, on Palamas, it was extremely influential and shaped the importance of ethicism in today's discourse, public discourse, in, in today's Russia. Still influential? Like it's yeah, still yes, his book, his, what, what, well, he, it was influential and it began probably to, probably he would have been uh, not happy with what happened afterwards with his legacy. But Meindorf's book was the influential, in the intellectual circles, of course, of the newly uh, new, newly born Christians uh, among, from among the Soviet intellectuals. The first book translated into Russian mm -hmm. in the late 80s, early 90s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it yeah, was, yeah, it was. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, Fl Florensky is, uh, is an icon. It's very, f is he read, in fact? Uh, I seriously doubt. But he, uh, the I name is an icon. I he, hope so, I hope uh, so. What about <laughs> me? <laughs> But no, I mean in Russia, <laughs> but, but well, no, not canonized. <laughs> well, yeah. uh, listen, mm -hmm. can we have a very quick question from, uh, from outside, but really it has to be a short question because we are a bit, well, we've run out of time already and a short answer. So, please. So, do you hear us? Oh, oh, sorry. I can see. Can you hear us? We have a question. Well, go ahead, but I think you have to write it down. No. I should write it down. No, oh, you can speak, it turns out. No, now it, it, uh, no, yeah. it works. <laughs> yeah, great, great. So, Please, Ivan. So hello to everybody. Speakers from France. Yeah, hello. We are sorry to be the present, but it was too hard to travel. Anyhow, um, I had one short comment and one question. The comment uh, be about the question of Byzantium being or not being. I mean, I definitely agree that Byzantium does not exist in the sense that uh, this is a term invented, as we know, in the early modernity and then applied on an empire. However, this empire did exist, but this space between the concept and the historical reality create this marvelous fluidity in which we can project whatever we want. And uh, the second question goes in the same direction. Um, speaking about Byzantinist, I like the idea, I mean, you sw switch them and understand why, because if I would, for example, speak of 19th century Russia and the Byzantinists I know, especially the art historian, which I love, obviously, um, they are actually being in the same paradox you just mentioned, meaning Kandakov was hating Byzantine art, but was investigating it as a patriotic duty. So there is this kind of switch between the intelligentsia and the meaning of the name within the context of the Russian culture or imagined as being Russian culture. This to me something really, really important. And so we are using Byzantium and abusing, putting in it whatever we want through the centuries. So this seems to me the notion which, which is interesting. So that has to be short. So this is it for now. Thank you so much. And thank you for the speech, which was wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, can, by the way, can, uh, one, one, one sentence. Kondakov also hated, hated Russia. He wrote in his diaries time and again that he doesn't understand in what sense he himself is Russian. He doesn't understand. He hates all Russians, all of them, uh, not uh, even before the revolution, but especially after it. But uh, yeah, he times right again. Why was I born Ru Russian? I had huge troubles because I wrote it. What you just said, and then um, Irina Khrushkova wrote at the time a monster from the West hating Russian culture because Kadakov was Pravoslavny <laughs> it, it, well, it was so funny. Uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but we really have to move to the next talk and then we'll have some more time to talk about that. I see we have uh, a new participant over there. <laughs> what a cute baby. As you see today is very easy because our next speaker is again someone who is so well known that I can just skip very quickly through um, uh, introducing uh, Professor Alexei Lidov, 
who, uh, as you know, is a world famous Byzantinist and, uh, Byzantinist and art historian, a specialist in Byzantine iconography, Christian uh, sacred images, and the theory of art. He's the founder and director of the Research Center for Eastern Christian Culture in Moscow and the head of the department at the Institute for World Cultures at uh, Moscow State University. Uh, Professor Lidov is the author of more than 150 research publications that have been translated into uh, many languages. I think he's probably best known for his term hierotopy that has been attracting more and more attention in recent years. Um, he has held fellowships and lectures all over the world, all, almost all the top universities, uh, including our institute where uh, he was a fellow two years ago. He's coming again uh, this year. At one point, he was the invited uh, guest uh, lecturer at the Villa Itati, the Harvard Center for Renaissance Culture in Florence, and many other places. So, um, Professor Lidov, we are looking forward to your talk. Great. 20 yeah. minutes. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, may I see the PowerPoint? Yes. Well, few preliminary remarks. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I don't feel myself uh, well today because probably I got the uh, kind of fever from my conditioning in the hotel. It was terribly chilly, and but hopefully, hopefully I will recover. And secondly, uh, <laughs> it's, it's strange enough and even interesting that I used a lot of examples which were presented already, mentioned by Klimena and presented by Sergei. Uh, and uh, what I should explain, first of all, why I started to work on the topic. Because about 15 years ago, I realized that there is a negative mythology of Byzantium, mostly in the Western minds, but not only, which practically harms all actual international relations. Uh, not directly, maybe, but indirectly. And uh, so it was a big surprise for me because I did not think in these terms. And then I studied, I started to study how this mythology took shape. And, uh, and also the obvious result of this mythology is uh, the linguistic point, the use of what Byzantium in all contemporary languages. More than 90% are obviously negative. Maybe in European languages, the only exception is uh, French word Byzance, which means uh, incredible luxury but we may judge, is it positive or negative? <laughs> it depends. So, and interesting too, that the same uh, uh, linguistic denial of Byzantine and Byzantine heritage uh, exists in Russia too. And in most cases, when any politician used the word Byzantine, at least nine of 10, it means something horrible. So it's a, uh, it's a claim. So, and uh, 
Well, the, how this uh, mythology took shape. First of all, I looked into the pilgrim accounts of the 11th and 12th century and found there the mix of admiration and jealousy from the Western travelers to Constantinople. Uh, and it's very true because at that time in the 12th century, Paris looked like a dirty village incomparable with uh, well, uh, the capital of the empire. Uh, and but the situation radically changed after the fourth crusaders So this is just remind you the map of Byzantium in different periods, sixth century uh, and well, subsequent periods. And so the symbol of uh, Byzantium, Hagia Sophia, which a year ago we discussed thoroughly because of this um, uh, disgusting political act by Erdogan who converted this museum into the walking mosque and practically uh, made a lot of treasures, artistic treasures of this church inaccessible. So this is uh, the crucial point and probably everybody knows what happened in the Fourth Crusaders uh, and uh, it was a devastating of the city in most horrible way, uh, even to such extent that their own Pope, Inocentius III, called them the dirty dogs, I mean crusaders. So, uh, and uh, practically um, they remove the Byzantine Empire as a main cultural center of Christianity. Well, and then the next period is, uh, I mean, this negative mythology was growing up step by step. Even in the Renaissance period, uh, Vasari used to call about um, uh, Terribile maniera Byzantina. Uh, at the same time, he did not want to not notice that the, the leaders, the, the artists whom he praised in his uh, biographies, uh, like Duccio or Cimabue, were truly Byzantine artists inspiring by the Byzantine models. But does not matter, already it was a mythology. Terribile maniera Byzantine. Montesquieu is already said, I mean, the culmination of his criticism was the point that uh, this civilization did not create anything except stupid veneration of icons. Uh, and I think it's, it's important that there are two most influential people of that era, of the 18th century, Montesquieu and Voltaire. Uh, they created a cliché for Byzantium and Byzantine heritage. Uh, Voltaire used two words, horrible de Guton. Too. And, uh, and it changed the situation radically, even in France and then in the all world on enlightenment, in all countries, because these two guys uh, were readable in, in all countries of, of that time, uh, including Russia. As you know, Catherine the Great was uh, sending letters to Walter ask his advice and even about, about Byzantium too. So it became a, so they 
publicistic uh, affair by Montesquieu and Voltaire became a part of academic life after Gibbon, who used uh, in his major book uh, this point, and he said that the whole history of Byzantium was the period of decline and uh, catastrophe, which created nothing inspiring for, for the rest of the world. So just destruction of the heritage of the Roman, Roman Empire. Well, and this is the most intelligent figure of that time. Usually we consider him with great respect, but what he used to write about Byzantium, in my view, is total stupidity and attempt to be up to date uh, in his writings. So it was already quoted the culmination of this approach, a disgusting picture of imbecility. <laughs> well, and it's said by Gigel, uh, the most influential intellectual of the time. So, and then it continues. So this tradition of negative mythology of Byzantium came to Arnold Toynbee, uh, but got a new paints, a new aspect. And uh, first of all, Toynbee made of Byzantium an explanation of the Cold War in uh, uh, historical and philosophical terms. So his point was that it is in a historical battle between Byzantium, then this tradition was inherited by Soviet Union, and the free democratic West. And so the result of this battle is not uh, obvious. In, in, at this point, he was correct, as we understand now. And he predicted what is going on and what we are able to see for the 21st century. And he said that it will be a great battle between the West, Russia, and China. So, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Byzantium and Byzantine heritage and all this stuff is a weapon of the, of the enemy. Well, one more intellectual, uh, I didn't have a chance to see Toynbee, but I had a chance to talk to, to Richard Pipes and maybe some other people in this audience. He passed away relatively recently. Uh, he was a very smart person, but uh, and he was a very influential person. He was advisor of the President Reagan for Russia and Russian affairs. Uh, maybe in general in Eastern European affairs. And uh, his main point, what his uh, kind of innovation which became very popular, the, the, the original thesis, he said that the main strategical mistake of the Byzantine world was that they were converted to Christianity, not from Rome, but from Constantinople. And in his view, uh, I mean, all other catastrophes related to this world, related to this main mistake made by Prince Vladimir uh, in the late 10th century. Well, so, and it, 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 it's point quite popular uh, among uh, Russian liberal uh, thinkers and journalists. They used to repeat it from time to time. Well, there is a very famous journalist, Vladimir Posner, who, without pointing out the source of the quotation, 
repeating the thesis regularly that if Russia took the Christianity from Rome, it was possible, everything would be fine. Well, but this is mythology. At the same time, we did not tell about, you know, academic scholarship and even the popular works from, from uh, this environment. And I just decided to show just two most influential books which appeared uh, recently. The book by Judith Herrin was translated in 20 languages, well, incredible amount, including Russian. Well, but without great effect. And uh, Caldelis was also translated into Russian. Uh, and then made a very serious academic revision of this negative myth of Byzantium uh, based on real historical sources. This may be some exaggeration, but uh, I mean, uh, they destroyed this mythology of Byzantium as uh, absolute monarchy without any uh, democratic institutions and uh, so Judith Karen demonstrated that in comparison with other medieval states, this state, Byzantine Empire, was very tolerant. Uh, the women played a very serious role in the society and so on. A lot of things which looks quite unexpected and, and strange on this background. So, but academic point, uh, is not important for, for the majority of people. And uh, because we should recognize it once more that in case of Byzantium, we're in situation of total ignorance. Especially, it's strange enough, especially in Russia, because in Russia, intellectuals know more about uh, Hindu yoga uh, I mean, uh, Japanese tea ceremony or Chinese feng shui, but not about their own Byzantine heritage. So, uh, empty space. And, and, and it is, it's a positive <laughs> element in it because it's very easy even for some politician who would like to manipulate from both sides with the Byzantine terms, uh, <laughs> they, they're not able to walk because there is no educational background for the general public. So you should know something to, to convince you that you know, uh, Byzantium is the most beautiful country in the world, well, or, or the, the most horrible country. It doesn't matter. People know nothing. So, and this is... Uh, I wanted to demonstrate the difference between the imperial behavior in Byzantium and Russia. And this uh, image from early 10th century of the Emperor Alexander in Hagia Sophia. And he is holding sphere as a sign of his uh, universal power. And in the right hand, Akakia. So it was a ceremonial uh, dress of the Byzantine emperors uh, entering Hagia Sophia. And Akakia, what does it mean, Akakia? It's uh, just a purse with, with earth. It means it was a symbol of uh, personal human humiliation of the emperor who was an image of God as the emperor, and at the same time, he was a uh, humble person. So, and this aspect of Byzantium did not exist in Russia. So, in, 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 Russian, in, in Russian monarchy. So, they reduced this to complicated uh, aspect. So, and this, uh, I, I don't want to repeat uh, this wonderful 
and uh, extremely interesting and unstudied project, so-called the Great Project by Catherine the Great, but you see the pictures, and uh, uh, Sergei did not mention uh, the uh, senior uh, executor of the project, I mean, uh, Prince Grigory Potemkin, who was actually a person who embodied and inspired Catherine the Great. By the way, interesting that Voltaire also supported this Byzantine project. And this is, I would like to show you some caricature. And this is caricature of the 18th century, but it may be on any contemporary newspaper. Uh, well, uh, so nothing changed anyway. So, and this is the, the, the general picture. So the Catherine the Great wanted to, to get Constantinople and all uh, European monarchs looking under her skirts. Yes, I'm finished. So, uh, Chidaev, we discussed it, but we should say, I mean, I, I repeat what uh, Sergei said, but uh, with great respect to Chidaev as a, one of the first Russian dissidents, uh, I should say that uh, he just repeated the uh, stupid statement by Montesquieu. Sometimes what in what? Well, uh, translated them into, into Russian. And, uh, but he suffered because of this, uh, you know, uh, brave, uh, uh, well, behavior and, uh, well, it's clear. So, but at the same time, there were other people, sometimes Western medieval historians, who said to Chedaev that not possible because Russia without Byzantine heritage um, uh, could not exist and all most important things in the culture were taken from Byzantium and so on. I mean, first of all, Timofey Granovsky and some others. Well, and uh, uh, in the 19th century, as on the background of this negative, negative mythology coming from the West, um, uh, the Russian Tsarism decided to create a positive mythology and initiated the so-called Neo-Byzantine project. The most famous uh, achievement of this project uh, is the Church of Christ the Savior in Moscow. Now it's the reconstruction of the 90s, but originally it's the project by architect Konstantin Ton. And so the new imperial vision of Byzantine heritage. An imperial, um, Russian empire wanted to um, uh, present uh, herself as a new Byzantium. And they invested a lot of money in intellectual powers and whatever. And by the way, it was uh, actual for, for the rest of Europe too, because it was a time of very strange neo-Byzantinism of, of, of the 19th century. I just, we just remember Sacre Coeur in Paris and, and many other churches. So, uh, empires wanted to have grandeur. And so this is Leontiev, uh, who actually, yes, he, he was not a Byzantine historian at all, but his text became a manifesto of this uh, positive, gilded Byzantine mythology. And this, uh, so this is in English. Uh, and this is the outcome of this uh, mythology, the appearance of these icons, non-official. Non so it was not recognized by the, the Russian Orthodox Church, but in some parishes, people used to, to, to paint such icons 
presenting Stalin as a culmination of Byzantine Empire. And uh, now it be becomes clear, and I did something, Sergei Ivanov did some important works about Stalin's Byzantinism. It's very interesting topic, not properly explored. This is the Byzantine metro station Kolominska, not Kolominska, Komsomolska, and with mosaics by Pavel Korin, with, you know, well, direct references to, to Byzantine icons with golden backgrounds, with uh, hellos, uh, uh, and so on. And naturally, no, no doubts that uh, this project was blessed by Stalin himself. So it was his manifestation embodiment of his new imperial Byzantine uh, vision. And uh, by the way, for art historians, it's interesting that this book could appear also in the context of this new well, Stalin's Byzantinism, uh, because no chance that any editor at that time could take initiative to, to publish this book. The second volume was full of icons in black and white pictures. So it was a shock for people uh, in, in, in the Soviet Union when they could, could buy this book, beautifully printed in Finland and so on. Well, this is Dugin. Well, it's an uh, attempt to, to, to use this Byzantine mythology for the new Russian fascism. And, uh, but he directly related to uh, Konstantin Leontiev uh, writings, its continuation. But of course, his views um, uh, got a lot of criticism in Russia, but uh, Dugin is quite influential per person, uh, but his critics are not. So they may write what they want, but well, unfortunately, in, in some environments, his ideas uh, works. And at the end, what I would like to say, that what we, the general picture for centuries, we see the battle of uh, fake mythologies, negative and positive. They had nothing to do with real Byzantium, and both sides participating in the battle are not interested in the understanding of the reality of Byzantine heritage and civilization. For example, I mean, with all this stuff, negative and positive, how we can explain that Byzantines used to, to pray looking at such icons? coming from Constantinople in the early 12th century. So something um, does not work <laughs> because this mythology, I mean, both types of mythology exist separately and this imagery uh, existed in their minds. Uh, totally, uh, totally separate of this uh, mostly political discussion but this aspect of cultural and spiritual heritage are very difficult to explore. And it's, uh, it needs a long-term program of education in the sphere. And this program of education does not exist. And what we have uh, is the stu stupid battle of uh, two false miss. Professor, um, I've, I, I finished. Yeah, thank you. I thought it's very nice to finish with this beautiful icon uh, over here. And uh, thank you very much for your talk, which the way I see it is it's about the modern battle over Byzantium. And uh, 
I, I found quite interesting the idea that, you know, we, we tend so much to think of, of Russia and other, you know, societies and cultures as coming out as being the heirs of Byzantium. And you paid some attention to, to also the difference between the two. It was great you showed uh, Judith Heron's book because she's the one who actually put us in touch. And this is how Professor Lidov became part of uh, our small community at, uh, at the Institute here. I think we have time, I'm afraid, for only one question. But you know, we, we'll have time later on to, to continue. So I'd like to see, is there anyone from the audience who has a question? If not, would anyone like to intervene here? And then among each other, we can continue the talk later on. Now, let me see. Okay, now, uh, any comments or questions? Uh, yes, please. One, one comment. Uh, uh, I'm doubting this uninterrupted hatred of Byzantium in the West beginning with the Fourth Crusade all the time up to Montesquieu because it, I think uh, this concept disregards the great interest in Byzantium expressed in the 16th and 17th centuries for different reasons. Uh, in Austria, they were interested who else was fighting the Turks. In southern Germany, they were interested who else was fighting with the Pope. And in Paris, they were interested who else was the king's son, uh, the, 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 the sunny, sun emperor. So, the Byzantine studies was flourishing in France in the 17th century. Yep. What would we do without Montfaucon? Yes. Um, uh, and Dukanj. Uh, uh, and Dukanj. So I don't see this uninterrupted line of hatred. No, I think it, it, it's rooted in, in the Enlightenment, in the French Enlightenment. And we should not necessarily connect this Enlightenment to the Fourth Crusade. Okay. That's my idea. Okay. Uh, and. Uh, well, well, I try to, to, to be based on sources. And uh, the intonation of Western opinions about Byzantium radically changed after the Fourth Crusades. Uh, and I, I think it's a good topic, well, for one of your students, maybe for a main thesis, to write uh, and to collect the all sources of this, you know, formation of the negative myth of, of Byzantium. Of course, it's it, it's you correctly pointed to to very important stuff which exists up to present moment. It is the hateness uh, mixed with admiration. Of, of the achievements. So they, I mean, the Western world remembered this, uh, <laughs> this admiration from the 11th and 12th century. And it, it continues. We know that in, in, in uh, all countries, including the United States, there are huge exhibitions of Byzantine art with great success and so on. And, but, uh, at the same time, we have this content analysis of languages. It is, it is a very serious argument that in nine cases of ten, the word Byzantium and Byzantine mean something negative. So this is the result. And this is uh, 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 something maybe existing under consciousness. Uh, and even, I should say, I was surprised and even shocked uh, when I read Jacques Ligoff's Birth of Europe. He wrote there, I, I have a quotation, uh, that uh, Europe, he means Europe, Western Europe, needs the enemy. And the Byzantium became an enemy to create its own identity. And what I, I, I said, I, I, I did not have time now, but the point is that for future, 
and for more appropriate communication, we should introduce the notion of Byzantine Europe and recognize that the European civilization as a synthesis of antique heritage and Christianity had two branches with some specific features. And as a result of historical circumstances, the second branch declined, but it did exist and was flourishing on very big territories and formed the, the identity. And, and this identity, Byzantine identity, still exists in some countries of the European Union and some countries who are going to be members of European Union. So, and it's not, we should discuss it. We should establish a dialogue because the idea is that these countries are not European or semi-European or semi-Oriental or, well, something which should be educated in, in Western way. It's, it becomes clear that this strategy does not work. Okay, thank you. Can I, uh, can we just have uh, Professor Christo very, very short questions? Very short questions. <laughs> Does the political force of collaboration in the Erdogan Turkey nowadays have any impact on the historical studies, studies in Russia? Are there scholars apt to reconsider the, the meaning of Byzantine Empire for Russian history, some new kind of mythology, something like that, or there is no such impact. I, I did not get the question. What was uh, the question? So let me repeat it. Uh -huh. So uh, the Russian, Russian Federation is an ally with Erdogan Turkey. Does this political course has enemy and ally? Ally. Right now, oh, I think. Uh, okay, it's hmm? not clear. <laughs> well, for, for me, it's not clear. Yeah, Maybe yeah. you know something <laughs> I don't know, but I mean, it's uh, the friendship which any time, uh, hmm. well, may become the, the, the big fight. So uh, I, I don't see that there are a lot of common interests between well it's just my point sorry yeah i see mm -hmm. but uh, my question is about the other historians are such influenced by such a, a political course are there new nuances some reconsidering the history uh, i think that the way i understand your question mm -hmm. is that to what an extent contemporary politics in, in the region and the relationships between Turkey and Russia nowadays are actually impacting this yeah. perception of uh, Byzantium. I think this is the question. Yeah, sure. And I think it's a question which relates very much to, of course, partly what our conference is about, you know, uh, explaining. Oh, well, uh, I, I should say, I should say that the, I don't know why uh, and I am glad that it did not happen, that the contemporary, the Putin's government uh, does not use this Byzantine mythology and Byzantine uh, heritage as a weapon, as a political weapon. Probably they don't understand how, how it works. <laughs> For them it's a kind of, you know, strange Greek fire, well, which might be, might be dangerous. So they don't use it as, for example, the Russian Empire used it in the 19th century. This is because nowadays people don't know enough about Byzantium. That's why they exactly. people like us. That's what I'm and, saying. And, and the result of <laughs> enlightenment, all this information was gradually reduced from the education. It's yeah. clear. Well, listen, shall we continue our discussion in the next room where there's coffee and biscuits? So, and then uh, we have, let me see. 
So it's uh, 10 to 12. Can we come in 15 minutes back to the room? So we'll start with uh, Valentina's favor after the coffee break. Uh, okay, so um, I'd like to uh, introduce our third speaker uh, of this uh, session. Um, Valentina Izmirleva is a professor of Slavic literatures at Columbia University, and uh, she's also the new director of the Harriman Institute one of the world's leading academic institutions devoted to Russian, Eurasian, and East European studies. She's starting her new uh, position from January 2022, uh, 19, well, 2022, yes, sure. <laughs> um, so, um, Valentina is a historian of Balkan and Russian religious uh, cultures. Much of her work addresses cultural exchanges among Christians, Jews, and Muslims in the context of multi-religious empires. She's the author of one of the books that you just saw in the room next door, uh, All the Names of the Lord, Lists, Mysticism, and Magic, which was published in 2008 and examines the traces of the Kabbalah in Christian texts across medieval and early modern Europe. She's also the co-editor of the volume Translation and Tradition in Slavia Orthodoxa. Her current book project is about Christian pilgrims to Jerusalem who took as their model the Muslim Haji to uh, Mecca. Uh, something which is quite relevant for the conference today. Uh, Valentina is currently preparing with art historian Hogan Klein an exhibition on Constantinople's Russian moment for the Para Museum in Istanbul. Valentina, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak at the conference and especially to Clemana and my hosts here in Vienna for their welcome. Um, I will delve right into my topic, which um, in a way continues the conversation that we had before the break, um, but on the face of it seems to lie outside. Um, I will be targeting one of the most fascinating moments in the age old Russo-Turkish rivalry over Constantinople and its uh, Byzantine imperial legacy. Following the defeat of the White Army in Crimea in November 1920, Close to 200,000 former subjects of the Russian Tsar found refuge on the Bosphorus, a human flood that swelled the population of Constantinople by 20% and caused a then unprecedented refugee crisis. The Turks called it peaceful, a peaceful invasion from the north, and it was indeed a symbolic invasion of the city, as a result of which, for a couple of years, Constantinople became almost Russian. I have called this transformative time the Russian Constantinople moment. With this shorthand, I identify a cluster of events that foreground first the significance of Constantinople for the history of the Russian global dispersion after the revolution, and second, the role of the Russian exile in the transformation of the city itself. Despite its significance, Russian Constantinople has been surprisingly understudied compared to other centers of Russian immigration. My work is part of a larger scholarly effort to put it on the map, and not only for Russian and Turkish studies, but also for the history of forced migration. In my brief presentation today, I will attempt to sum up the significance of this moment together with its historical peculiarities in the form of three paradoxes. So paradox one, the Russians had dreamt to conquer Constantinople for centuries, but when they finally arrived in the city of their imperial dreams, they came not as victors, but as refugees. 
Constantinople has always loomed large, as we heard already in the Russian imagination and specifically in the Russian political imagination. Russians called it Tsargrad, the city of the Tsar. And ever since it fell under Muslim rule in 1543, it dreamt of placing a Russian cross on Hagia Sophia. In 1915, during World War I, the Russian government secretly signed an agreement with the Allied forces that allowed Russia's control over Constantinople and the Straits in case of Germany's defeat. But, of course, Russian faith was sealed otherwise, and the opportunity was lost in the bloodbath of the revolution. That's one of the most poignant ironies in recent Russian history, is that when the remains of the Russian army finally made it to the city of the Tsar, they arrived not as conquerors, but as faithless people in search of a harbor. The city that met them was not the city of their imperial dreams either, but a defeated and divided city under the Allied occupation, 1918-23. Partitions among the French, British, and Italian occupying armies, and soon to be relegated as Istanbul to the periphery of the emerging Turkish Republic, the city was in many ways a stranger to itself. And no one was really at home there, not even the Turks. So when the Ottomans and the Russians met in the city that epitomized for them their imperial ambitions, uh, they met not as rivals measuring their relative political might as they had done during many wars, but as losers made equals in their shared ruin, as have-beens who had found themselves on the proverbial wrong side of history. Paradox number two, the Russian refugees had not come to Constantinople to stay, but to wait. And they thought of their time in the city as empty, time spent in a waiting room, so to speak. But it proved deeply transformative for them and for the city that hosted them. The Russians expected to return to Russia as soon as the political tide turned. And when it became clear that it wouldn't, they only waited there for a passage westward toward the mirages of Paris, Berlin, New York. So by the end of 1923, most of them left. And the moment, in other words, was brief. It was not meant to last. For the refugees, however, this constant upper moment was not so much a segment of time locked between 1919, when the first of them arrived, and 1923, when most of them left. In a much more important sense, it was a mode of being, a state of suspended existence, both between and meanwhile, a pure interval experience. It granted the exiles not only a necessary distance from the trauma of the revolution and the civil war, but also a reorientation, a new perspective that allowed them to reorient and redefine themselves so that they could move forward. It was in Constantinople that for the first time, the former subjects of an empire had to accept their stateless existence and collectively reinvent themselves as citizens of the world, but also as Russians without Russia, in a, word, in a world where Russia did not exist anymore. Such radical dissolution of previously solid identities unlocked, together with much grief and despair, an enormous charge for creative experimentations that forever changed both them and their hosts. And while the refugees tried to make do with whatever they had at their disposal to survive, they transformed not only themselves, but also left indelible traces on the city of their dreams. After this Russian moment, Constantinople was never the same. The Russians had introduced new artistic forms from classical ballet to jazz, and revived already burgeoning ones as classical music and visual arts, especially realist genres such as landscapes and portraiture. And they strive to survive, thousands of artists among the refugees engaged across the city in nonverbal performing arts, 
which easily evaded the language barrier. Improvisation became the art of survival for them, the template for creative subversion of trauma and loss, and for cultural dialogue across difference. The most visible results of their improvisational tactics, however, were left on Turkish everyday life. The Russian visitors transformed the urban texture and habits of the Ottoman capital, especially in the sphere of leisure. They introduced new eating establishments in Beyoğlu with such innovations as female waitresses and dancing floors and encur that encouraged gender commingling. Um, they also introduced the Ottoman palate to Russian cuisine with such innovations as borscht and the stroganov and of course Russian vodka. We should remember that um, Smirnov uh, launched his famous brand exactly then and there. The Russians also imported from Crimea their beach culture creating modern non-segregated beaches along the Bosphorus and the Princess Islands, teaching the Istanbulus how to enjoy swimming in the sea and sunbathe. Street culture was also modernized, especially in terms of fashion, this quintessential female sphere of maternity. Russians introduced the short hairdos, the dropped waistline, and the raised hemline of the jazz age together with European-style shoes and Russian furs. A new refugee-run shops of seamstress ateliers sprouted across the city. And that brings us to paradox number three. It was women, not men, who were the main agents of cultural change, and thus the real protagonists of the Russian moment in Constantinople. So why the women? not the men. The male effort of the civil war had failed and the new brutal reality of the exile um, put men at a double disadvantage of being emasculated by their political and military defeat and by having lost all the sources on which their gender power was based back in Russia. Not so with the women. Apart from their evident greater adaptability, which seems to be a cultural and psychological fact, women, in this case the Russian women, had the added advantage of providing the Ottoman society with living, breathing, and visually accessible models of European-style modernity. Ottoman society in the Roaring Twenties was um, on the brink of its own modernization. Borrowed Western ideals of modern femininity dominated the city's imaginary, but they could do little in the way of providing practical models for transforming the outmoded Ottoman gender dynamic. Unlike the Levantines, these are both um, um, locals uh, from, from the Levant and Westerners who had gone native um, in the Ottoman Empire, uh, they had uh, uh, so unlike the Levantines who had pushed for modernization of Istanbul, the Russian female refugees were no surrogate, surrogates of Western modernity. They were the real thing. Among them were not only members of the upper crust of Russian society, whose culture and education rivaled any of Europe's best, but also a large share of Russia's cult creative elite. Many of them spoke several languages, had refined social manners, shake Parisian style clothes even in tatters. So they easily emerged as icons of modern female sophistication and elegance, despite their sorry circumstances. The Russian women, elegant, cultured, physically distinct in both appearance and attire from Ottoman women, became the ultimate cathetic objects uh, for the city the object of both male sexual, however ocular only, and female mimetic desire. Um, significantly, many of these women who flooded the city were both trained and talented in a variety of arts, from classical ballet and modern dance to jazz, folk and popular music. 
and their desperation urged them to put their skills to work in the numerous entertainment establishments. Um, putting their female refugee body, both revealed and repackaged, on the stage is an effective tool in their struggle for survival. Classical ballet, which the Russians are credited with introducing to Turkey, is perhaps the best example to illustrate a larger trend. By revealing the female shoulders, arms, and legs, while repackaging the body in a fantasy of silk, tarlatan, tulle, and gauze clouds, ballet performances produced a tantalizing yet culturally sophisticated image of sublime female beauty. And the Turks, Levantines, and Westerners alike unanimously expressed their ap appreciation in a collective harasho, which could quickly became a loan word in Turkish as an appellative for Russian women. <laughs> and then in a telling synecdoche for all Russian refugees, which proves discursively that the women were indeed the public face of the refugees in Constantinople. So if in the end, the Russians did conquer Constantinople, however briefly, it was with a female touch. And in conclusion, a possible lesson since today's history is, today history is valued, it seems, only for its lessons, the lessons that it teaches us. So we are accustomed to think about crises as problems, problems to be solved, as disasters to be neutralized. This, however, is a relatively modern meaning of the term. As all the Byzantinists in the room know, the New Testament notion of crisis, developed later by Byzantine theology, is an opportunity to be embraced, a teachable moment, if you will, not a problem to be solved. So there's perhaps a lesson in the Russian Constantinople moment for our own society, obsessed as it is with the paranoia about threat from refugees. The Constantinople interlude of the 1920 reveals that Extending a hand of welcome, even to our deadliest enemy, and even in a moment when we are facing our own crises or two, as the Ottomans did to the Russian refugees, um, is not only just a gift to the guests, it is always already a gift to ourselves, though the rewards may not be easy to foresee within the moment itself. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Valentina. Great. I thought this was a wonderful contribution to uh, our topic today. I was personally very interested in something that we've talked with you before, as uh, I work a little bit on the Russian avant-garde. And I always think that what makes the Russian avant-garde stand out among other European avant-garde is the central role that women play. You know, you hear these women who are at the forefront of the movement. You know, Natalia Goncharova is not just the partner of Larionov, but she's, you know, uh, an artist on her own. Uh, on her own. And I think that it's interesting to see. I never thought about that, about the role of Russian women, some of them coming from the avant-garde in this context, in the context of refugees going to uh, Istanbul after the Russian Revolution. I think it's just very interesting and something important to think through. But, you know, I don't need to, to talk too much here. I'd like to ask, are there any questions, comments? Professor yes. Lidov, I'm not surprised, uh, you're usually very active, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I uh, recover it a little bit, so <laughs> okay, I should good. use this chance to <laughs> of course, don't to miss talk, it. <laughs> to talk and to, to, Im <laughs> to improve the environment. Well, uh, first of all, w do you have any statistics how many of Russian emigre lived in Istanbul after the revolution? Yeah, uh, lived or passed through? Uh, most of them passed through. No, no, I mean who remained and who remained. made an impact in the Turkish society. Well, uh, 
almost nobody remained after 23. And for nobody uh, remained. Almost. I mean, there are some important people like uh, uh, the woman who became the main um, uh, force behind the establishment of the Turkish ballet, um, a person that our exhibition in um, Istanbul is why, why, why they did not stay? Well, two reasons. Uh, first of all, Istanbul was a mess at the time, and they didn't have much to give them to begin with. But most importantly, there were external forces that were pushing them out. The Kemalists had already forged an alliance with the Bolsheviks, and when, uh, after the end of the, of the so war, at Turk. uh, at the Turks government, uh, issued an ultimatum to the refugees. You either um, accept Turkish citizenship, which was not advantageous to them uh, by and large, or you move out, uh, preferably in the direction of Moscow. Uh, so um, they were effectively pushed out once the French, who were um, their protectors in Istanbul, at least legally, uh, had left. And one um, more concrete question. Have you seen the movie Big? Yes. The Run? Yes. So course. probably the only movie, very good movie, about the Russian uh, immigration in Istanbul. It, it, it is um, kind of a fantasy, uh, I would say. I mean, no, no, it's not a Bulgakov, documentary. Bulgakov himself was never part of this I mean, uh, refugee wave. His second wife was, so his play was based on uh, hearsay, on stories that he heard from his wife. Um, but the Soviet version of, of the film, of course, is something else. And one of the representative, um, the, the good examples of what became the Bolshevik and then the Soviet narrative about uh, these people as uh, if there is a battle of the fake mythologists about Byzantium, there is one about the fake mythologists of the Russians in Constantinople as well. Um, no, well, of course, they, 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 they wanted to show the catastrophe yeah. of immigration and it, it was natural, but Ludi, cockroach, yeah, and, all that. and coming back at the end, coming back to their motherland, yeah, for, for, <laughs> for, for future tragedy. Well, uh, but it's, I mean, it, I, I remember it because the film director of uh, of this movie was my relative, so we were invited for for the first presentation, and uh, it was sensational from many points of view at that time. It was can, I, can I interrupt a little bit? Because uh, our colleagues from France that you can see over there have also a question. Adrian, you are very welcome to uh, uh, ask your question or make your comment. Oh, Ivan, Ivan uh, I don't think we can hear you. Yeah, you can. Let him. Yes. Now? Oh, okay. Uh, yes, now it's okay. Well, thank you so much. I wanted just to jump on what you said, uh, Klemena, on the question of the female presence within Russian immigration, which I find extremely important on two levels. On the one side, when we look further, not only in Turkey, obviously, but we go to Czechoslovakia, to France, um, and so on, we find fundamental figures on the one side promoting Russian culture and thinking, and we will speak briefly about Seminario Vukodakovianum later, where all important positions are the male swan, but the real deus ex machina is a woman. And so there is a, a person in behind which is kind of pushing all the movements. So this is very important. And I would like also to remember other figures um, which are actually at the heart of the feminist movement, for example, of France. Uh, we can remind Izvolskaya, for example, who is a person very important who will like be moving forward into the intellectual thinking and not to speak about obviously artists, creators, illustrators, and so on, bringing to France mainly um, the Russian culture of illustration. So just to say that I, I, I see it as a very important and large topic, 
the Russian female immigration as one of the crucial elements into the construction of the interwar European uh, wave of culture and emancipation and questions which were asked obviously around 1900 in Russia and when suddenly are moving to the West. So the Russian avant-garde thinking going through female immigration within the Western Europe, this to me fascinating. So this was just my comment. So thank you very much for your speech because I, I really find it illuminating and at the same time really part of this large network of female identity which should be explored, I would say, more than this up to now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. And I just want to say that um, there is perhaps even a larger um, Christian uh, narrative here um, about uh, that proves uh, again, I, I have done some work on the widows, the role of widows in um, Christian history. Uh, this phenomenon of widows stepping forward and taking charge of a critical situation each time things go south. And the moment when things stabilize, the male establishment of, um, pushes them to the margins again. That happened um, in early Christian history. It happened during the iconoclastic period in Byzantium. It happened uh, during the Ottoman period in the Balkans. It happened during the Soviet period uh, in Eastern Europe. Um, so it's, it's a pattern that repeats itself uh, that suggests to me that independent women are uh, stronger, more capable of dealing with crisis uh, for whatever reason than, um, than men are. Um, it could be, be because of the way women are acculturated and they are uh, taught how to think outside of the box and that's what a crisis situation and survival requires. I don't know the bigger answer, um, but it also liberates uh, break some of the structures, the crisis, break some of the structures that uh, regiment the roles of genders uh, and allows for women to, to actually take charge. Um, right. They were some of the survivors. Uh, Yashvil, we will speak about later, is the only person who survived from all her family, her and her daughter. So all the male persons were killed. And so Yashvil went to Prague, having been a very important people of the Red Cross in Russia, but she was the only survival. So this is also part of the, I absolutely believe that you're right, that in period crisis and the construction of social, social structures, women should not be married, for example, some of them, because the, the society had collapsed. But on the other side, also we should have in mind that in this white immigration, especially the first and second wave, there were so many persons killed and they will especially males. So this is also the other part of the, of, the, of the game, that when you kill the relevant males, the widows, as you said, take the, the, the banner because they are the only survivors, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That, that's can, a good I, uh, can I intervene with a very short practical question uh, by uh, Martin uh, Burkhardt. So his question is, what were the reasons that led the Russian immigrants to Istanbul and not to, say, Berlin or Paris? Well, I mean, the, the wave that came to Istanbul was from Crimea. This was as the Civil War pushed the white army um, further and further uh, to the to Novorossiysk and the tipping point of Crimea, uh, and they were losing territory, and a lot of war refugees were following them or uh, leaving with them. At some point, all they had behind their back or in front of their face was the sea, and the closest place to, to get to was Constantinople, which at that point was in the hands, as I said, of the occupied forces who were the, the Russian, um, Tsarist Russia former allies. So um, they were given um, a place to stay for a while and even the army had a place uh, in Gallipoli um, to um, regroup, waiting for things to turn, uh, the tide to turn in, in um, 
Russia and for them to return as the victorious army and take charge. Um, Paris and Berlin was far, were far away. Some, of course, fled to Paris and Berlin, but this was the first massive wave, especially in November 1920, when uh, after the defeat of Wrangel's army in Crimea, within the span of days, more than 126 battleships packed with over 200,000 refugees uh, came to they the Also, uh, it's important aspect that most of these refugees were quite poor, or very poor. So, uh, in case, for example, which uh, favorite figure by Ivan Faletti, uh, Nikodim Kondakov, left Crimea in the same compartment with Ivan Bunin, yeah. and they arrived to Constantinople, and he was waiting there the invitation from Prague, which he received relatively quickly, but it took some months. So, uh, but they simply did not have money to live in Paris and, 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 and Berlin. In Constantinople, it was much cheaper. I mean, the, the, condition, the living conditions were despicable. I mean, the, the, it was squalor and, and poverty and utter desperation, uh, especially this third wave. Uh, the first wave uh, in mid-1990, uh, they left with some some assets that were able to bring uh, and, and to live fairly comfortably in the beginning in Constantinople. But the last wave, they didn't have any chance to bring anything, money at that point, uh, even if they brought some, was cost nothing. Um, so it was... Um, disaster. A disaster, yeah. <laughs> Okay, a couple. I'm afraid we don't have time for a couple. So, Mano, please summarize. All of this. And how do you measure the transformations, both in Turkish society and among the refugees? Because one of the claims you've made is that this experience was transformative not only for the refugees themselves and also for Turkish society. So I have a methodological question, and that is, how do you measure this? for the two populations. Have you looked, for example, at Ottoman journals? And did these cultural institutions, and I want to know who paid for them, um, did they survive once the refugees left? Because if not, there was no transformation. There was a momentary change to meet the needs of a population that wanted to do these things. So. These are all very good questions, but um, I, I have to say that about the measurements, I'm not a political scientist, so I don't measure, I don't use statistics. My sources are mostly uh, contemporary documents, contemporary narratives, uh, and... Uh, I mean, what, what kind of narratives? Memoirs? Or? Uh, and, and anything from letters and memoirs to newspaper articles to um, uh, document, uh, diplomatic... Um, documents of exchange and negotiation. Um, so, uh, yes, I don't have the fine tools to tell you how many, how many percentages and how long and how, what portion of the population of Istanbul was indeed um, affected. But it is uh, a topos in Ottoman and then Turkish uh, both literature and historiography and even current scholarship that a lot had changed in the city under the influence of this um, Russian ferment that passed through the city quickly but left indelible traces there. As for the Russians, um, since you have uh, an incredible group of cultural and political, also religious figures passing and staying in Constantinople for a couple of months or for a year and a half, we can trace their development in the West after Constantinople and see how uh, they reflect on their stay in Constantinople uh, and how 
um, the, their experience there affected or didn't affect their um, life and work afterwards. I will just give you briefly one example with uh, Ilyas Danievich Ilyas, who spent about, uh, he's a member of the Russian avant-garde, uh, of the Russian futurists, and spent about a year and a half in Constantinople, kind of desperately like in the film Casablanca, waiting for a transit visa and wanting to leave, and this is empty time, and why am I wasting my time in Constantinople? And then with the hindsight, when he went to Paris, realized, and, and there's documentation in letters and in his own novels afterwards, an acknowledgement of how much this experience has changed him and how much he wished it lasted longer. And his most famous uh, early typographic masterpiece, Le Farum, which kind of pushed his work in a new direction uh, in Paris, uh, was in fact created in Istanbul, even though it was executed in Paris the following And who year. paid for the cultural activities? Because who that's paid? an important point. This is a, a long, uh, like a question that requires a long answer, and I don't know whether we have that now, the time, but um, there were uh, a lot of Western um, efforts to support the refugees, um, different initiatives, some of them were channeled through the embassies, including the Russian embassy, which functioned for a while in Constantinople through the, through the moment. Um, but uh, so, so there, were, there were certain institutions, right, like the Beacon, Mayak, Druzhstvo Mayak, which was founded by the American uh, YMCA, for example. Um, there were um, campaigns to collect money from the West in order to support the refugees. Um, and some of the money was earned by the refugees. I mean, they supported themselves by earning money in Constantinople or relying in some cases to some rich relatives who had already established themselves in Paris. So, so it's, it's a... Now that the conversation turned to money, I got reminded about food. So I think we'll have to move again to the room next door where uh, there'll be lunch for us. Now, you may notice that the program has changed, changed a little bit in order to fit in with the time. So we will have, after lunch, uh, Professor Ivan Christoph will first present briefly his uh, book, a, a project he's been working on for some time, and then we'll have his talk, and then we'll go from there. So uh, please, let's move to the next room. Well, yes. Ivan, are you ready? Yeah. Wait a minute. Just uh, ask the technical staff to start the I never said that. Ivan, Ivan, molete 20 minuti. Okay. So, uh, okay. Welcome back to uh, our afternoon session. So uh, the speaker now will be Ivan Christov, who is a full professor at the Faculty of Theology at Sofia University. He is the head of the Department of Systematic Theology there. His main interests are in ancient philosophy and the adoption of some elements of its language in Christian theology. Uh, he's held many prestigious fellowships and positions all over Europe. I met him at, uh, when he was a fellow many years ago. It's embarrassing to say how long ago it was, but he held a fellowship at All Souls College at Oxford. Um, and since then, we've kept in touch. He's been very productive, and as you just saw, one of his new uh, publications, uh, other works he's done are mainly on the Cappadocians, 
uh, Dionysius the Areopagite, uh, Patriarch Photius, uh, Michael Psellus, and generally Byzantine theology in the 14th century. Uh, he's also done some excellent work as a translator. He's translated Aristotle's Organon and the Metaphysics and is the editor of Aristotle's selected works in six volumes. So, uh, Ivan, you have the floor and we're looking forward to your paper. Dear colleagues, first of all, I need to clarify the most intriguing title of my paper. It's a metaphoric one and being such may give rise to a variety of misunderstandings. I would like to clear them at the outset. On one hand, the title could be taken loosely as somehow related to the ecumenical patriarchate of Constantinople as the last leaving part of the second row. There is nowadays a set of controversial issues related to this most important spiritual center of Eastern Christianity and a biased listener could feed an expectation that they are considered by me destructive and leading to another fall. This is completely wrong. I am not going to touch any such issue and feel deep respect to the ecumenical patriarchate. On the other hand, provided the ambition of the Republic of Turkey and its high potential, the title of my paper could wrongly be understood in a geopolitical way as pointing to some dramatic shift on Islamic side back <coughs> to a revival of the Ottoman Empire. In fact, my paper is dedicated to the cultural and spiritual attitudes Byzantines had to the Western world that constituted a feeling of all identity, although their state was part of the Roman Empire and its legi legitimate continuation to the extent that they themselves called it a second Rome. These attitudes of distinction with the Western world might have some impact on the, on the Eurasian political theory and mythology. The title of my paper is based on a saying by John Cantacuzenus, a Greek nobleman, statesman, emperor from 1347 to 1354, who since his deposition retired to a monastery under the name Yoasaf Christodoulos and was in interested to negotiate with Western legates. This was one of the two lines that the Byzantine Empire followed in its policy of surviving the Ottoman threat. On the other hand, dramatic attempts were made to reach an, an agreement with the Catholic West and this doomed mission was interesting to him. Uh, the other way was interested to Patriarch Philotus. I uh, said a few words about his mission and his skepticism. Now, much greater was the, the disappointment by John Cantacuzenus. Uh, one of his statements is that um, Latins are enemies of the Byzantine man, not only in terms of his body and property, but also in terms of his soul, unlike the Turks who would only plunder and destroy the Byzantine Empire. Therefore, Turks are for him the lesser evil. They would conquer the second Rome just once, in a material sense, and only plunder the empire. While conquering, conquering by Latins, it entangles a second spiritual fall. Let me give a brief outline of the main stereotypes the Byzantines have built for the western part of Europe. The critical event that led to the high disrespect on Byzantine side was the Second Crusade. After it, friendship and mutual trust were no more possible. The point of no return was also the Fourth Crusade. Since the middle of the 12th century, 
the two Christian parts of Europe clashed with ever increasing force. So how was work considered Latins? First, a wild horde. A wild horde similar horde similar or even the same like the one that destroyed the first Rome. The Byzantine historians, such as Nicetas Coniates, Eustatius of Thessalonica, etc., give ample evidence for barbaric behavior on the western part. They ate and drank in the devastated homes, behaved scand scandalously, urinated in the wells, then drew water from them, used one and the same dish for drinking wine and as a slop jar. Another negative trait ascribed to the Latins, they are robbers and assassins. Unfortunately, history at that time gave, gave us a lot of evidence supporting this statement. Philotus Cocinus had to negotiate with some Genoese gang who invaded his eparchy and he had to pay ransom for the most uh, prominent citizens, but many others were killed. Um, well, Latins are even worse. They are hypocrites and sac sacri sacrilegers. Hypocrites, because they are hiding behind the ideology of holy war, but actually are striving for domination over their Christian brothers. The Crusaders behaved in a hostile manner and were striving to conquer the Byzantine Empire. The conquerors pretending to fight for holy lands and for Christian faith were not only hypocrites, but sacrilegers. They did not respect the holy places, killing even in the churches. They threw the icons on the floor, tramped them, and if these were adorned with some valuable jewel, they would tear, tear it away and take, take the icons to crossed roads where people would walk on them or simply lit their fires with them. They also jumped on the altars and sang barbaric song. During liturgy, they would interrupt the priest sing blasphemous song, songs or bark like dogs. <laughs> Latins used the mirror from the grave of St. Demetrius of Saloniki in the pots where they cooked their fish or used it to polish their shoes. And one was uh, nail in the coffin of the Latins. They were unsincere and unreliable in their personal relationships with Byzantines. Though Latins may resemble friendship, submitting to the needs of the time, they yet despise of us, says his Eustatius, as their bitterest enemies. And though their speech is affable and smoother than oil flowing noiselessly, yet their words are darts, and thus they are sharper than a two-edged sword. Between us and them, the greatest gulf of disagreement has been fixed, and we are separated in purpose and diametrically opposed, even though we are closely associated and frequently share the same dwelling. All this led to rejection of the very idea of alliance with them. So, say jo Joseph Brienius rejects any possibility of a white support from the Latins saying, although they claim to come and protect us, they would rather raise their weapons to destroy our state, our country and our good name. Uh, Latins, according to Cocinus, Patriarch Philotus Cocinus, are the source of the most offensive and severe disasters suffered by the Byzantines. And I've already uh, quoted John Catacuzinus uh, saying uh, of Latins 
as much worse enemies than Turks because they will um, destroy not only Byzantine states and Byzantine prosperity, but also Byzantine spirituality. One would easily find parallels between these Byzantine attitudes and the contemporary anti-European pro propaganda. So let me now formulate the real problem. After many centuries, in 20th, 21st century, part of the countries historically belonging to the Byzantine Commonwealth chose joining a geopolitical union with the Western world, the European Union. Would the worst exp expectations of the Byzantines come through? Does it mean a second fall of the second Rome, this time spiritual and cultural? This question is not just rhetorical. You can face it in certain circles in Eastern Europe who are seeking for different geopolitical orientation of the region. According to these circles, uh, participation in the European Union means uh, financial and economical devastation of the uh, Eastern European countries, the political uh, and military union of NATO means entering into alliance with cures uh, who has devastated the Middle East, etc., 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 etc. I'm not going to uh, repeat this kind of propaganda here. So, uh, these uh, historical stereotypes inherited from Byzantines are used in the modern propaganda, anti-European and anti-NATO uh, propaganda. Then, uh, what is actually the reality in the 20th, 21st century? On spiritual side, claiming, uh, claims of suppressing the Byzantine tradition are obviously absurd. It's impossible in modern Europe that serving the cult of some Christian denomination would be suppressed. This is persecuted both by the local and the European walls. No such examples could be used here. There, however, are some bad practices. I'll mention some of them, but later we'll say, uh, we'll talk about the good practices which made some balance and uh, uh, I will express my uh, faith that with time all the problems will be balanced, all the problems will be solved. What about the bad practices? They uh, affect not the freedom of serving God, but rather the religious self-consciousness, that is theology. First of them is the global mechanism of appreciation, the academic results which put in an unequal position the orthodox theologian. In, and the second point, I will develop it a little bit later, is the century long practice of sponsoring the so-called coturn making services. I will explain what does it mean. Concerning the first point, the global mechanism, mechanism of appreciation favorizes Western Christian theology. And I will give ex an example with two prominent, really great theologians on Orthodox and on Catholic side. On Orthodox side, the Metropolitan Oxford Professor Callistus Ware. And on uh, Catholic side, Professor and uh, prominent Catholic theologian Brian Daly. Well, Web of Science gives to Callistus Ware three points the so called Hirsch factor. <laughs> But to Brian Daly, it gives five points. Well, to Callistus 
in the web of science, Callista Swear have nine publications. Well, not because he wrote only nine papers, but because the, the orthodox journals are not included in general. Well, Brian Daly has 37, which makes four times more. Uh, concerning dissertations, Callista Swear have 23 citations, and Brian Daly, 113, five times more. So, uh, Brian Daly is between three and five times more important with the best, with a better academic achievement than Callista Swear. It's an obvious absurd. Uh, it's, uh, makes, it makes no sense. It's not important to Callista Swear. It's not important to Brian Daly, but <laughs> it makes crucial importance on the career of, of young scholar, of young theolo uh, orthodox theologian. It is at the outset uh, in an unequal position to his or, uh, Catholic colleague. Well, concerning the cultural making services. And there is actually still nowadays a practice of fiberizing the artisans, cotur makers. In general, I will explain the word after a while. In general, I mean uh, a practice of creating ersatz versions of Eastern Orthodox theology to substitute the genuine ones in the confessional dialogue. Normally, the masters of, in this business are looking for a middle, converging element of the two doctrines. Uh, the Greek word which is used uh, to designate this bad, best, uh, this bad practice is cotornus, or in Latin, coturnus. It means a leather shoe, shoe, shoe with a raised platform feeding on both feet, on the left, on, on the right. And it was used in ancient time by tragic actors. Um, for the first time, uh, for the Orthodox and Latin debate, uh, this form of uh, cotton making was used by uh, Michael of Ephesus. And it uh, qualified uh, the, the effort of the major majority on Byzantine part, oh, great, uh, to, to do the, their best to represent the Greek position in an acceptable way. They really uh, betrayed uh, the Orthodox tradition. And this was appreciated in the Orthodox countries correspondently. Well, I do not have much time, so uh, I will limit myself just by a statement uh, that, that uh, in times of the grant system, you can always find cheap uh, guys from the Eastern Europe and uh, involve them in uh, work in this direction. And it works. It's not uh, dangerous, however, uh, because uh, it's uh, easy distinguishable. So everybody is happy. Some is making his business, is in uh, getting his grants, but uh, the, or the Orthodox tradition is not seriously endangered. So, well, let it be. Um, now, what about the positive uh, developments in the European Union? The good practices, which to a great extent neutralize uh, what we have inherited from the past. Uh, well, 
later. Uh, uh, I'll share another uh, interesting moment. Uh, some favorization of old players in the ecumenical dialogue, which proved to be communist political agents. <laughs> in my country, it is clearly visible. Uh, the communist political police trained certain person uh, to be very flexible to uh, get the trust of the Western side and to be used as a sort of a source of information and to manipulate as uh, possible, as much as possible, the Western part. And after many years, we have still uh, quite a lot of example, examples that exactly these persons are engaged in, a, in the ecumenical dialogue, dialogue and it is unexplainable is so far as for the past 30 years so many young uh, persons uh, traveled to the west living for a quite a lot of time there and actually they're genuine they keep to the uh, to the order of tradition but what about the good, good practices uh, i would like to mention two uh, big european projects uh, we take part in them their own religious studies. The very idea of, of religious studies is uh, positive. It means to develop an objective, confessionally impartial study of religions, religious behaviors, beliefs, and institutions. And uh, it is uh, a multidisciplinary by nature, which uh, gives more uh, chance to impartiality, such projects are RARES and Resilience Project. RARES um, aimed at uh, creating research infrastructure, infrastructure of religious studies. Sophie University uh, participate in this project with its electronic dictionaries, Old Slavonic, Greek, and with the corpus of uh, old Slavonic texts. Uh, Ray Res project uh, now uh, is shifting to a larger resilience project uh, who is designed for 35 years. It has the approval of the European Science Foundation and uh, it is uh, quite uh, decently uh, sponsored. The idea is to intensify the human uh, academic contacts, uh, to uh, organize schools, summer schools, used from uh, schools all over the Europe, also to go further, further developing electronic instruments, also uh, a, a specialized information system is developed now and soon will be at uh, the disposal of scholars. It's multilingual, Old Slavonic, Greek, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Another very positive development are the so-called patristic colloquies between theologians of Catholic and uh, Orthodox countries. This year, in September, the 10th colloquy will take place in Vienna. The entire series of these colloquies was initiated by the Vienna Archbishop, Cardinal Schomborn. And the first uh, two meetings were held here in Vienna. Uh, after that, uh, uh, Greece, Romania, Ukraine, uh, Luxembourg, uh, Hungary hosted such colloquies, Bulgaria. I took part in the organization of the Bulgarian meeting in Varna in 215. Uh, this is extremely positive uh, development. 
because we have a direct dialogue and we publish our papers in the already nine, nine of them are published by ProOriente Vienna. Uh, and uh, I have a positive conclusion. Uh, no second fall of the second Rome is pending, but time is <laughs> pressing, so. <laughs> okay, we're glad to know. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I thought that was, that was very interesting. We have time for one question or comment. You know, as someone coming from Bulgaria, I have to say that especially the first part of your of your talk sounded so familiar to me, you know, the way you spoke about how this sort of anti-Latin rhetoric in Byzantine times has spilled over nowadays in an anti-Western way. So uh, this for me was something that really sort of sounded very, very familiar. Uh, any comments, questions? Uh, Mano, please. So I was struck by one of the commentators about the threat posed by the Latins to, to Orthodox, to Byzantine spirituality. Now, this seems to me to display a certain kind of insecurity towards Latin Christendom. Because it's one thing to have conquerors destroy the churches, you know, be disrespectful to icons. That's one thing. But that doesn't. The, the threat suggests that there was some kind of heretical appeal of Latin Christian ideas that were in conflict with the orthodox ones. Because if you're very confident in your own interpretations of Christianity, then you don't have anything to fear from someone else who may be militarily more strong. Well, Manu, uh, the Byzantine had a bitter experience of political uh, pressure over the religious consciousness. When you, for instance, when you enter uh, the Zographos Monastery on the Holy Mountain, mountain the first you, you th uh, see is a mon monument uh, commemorating the uh, martyrs, monarchs, who were burned alive from Latin supporters in, Byz in Byzantium, just because they uh, are keeping to the Orthodox faith. Huh. And uh, this is not an isolated uh, example. Then the entire history of uh, the Council of Ferrari in Florence. Uh, Byzantium was in, uh, actually in a desperate position. And uh, uh, Joseph, the Constantinopolitan patriarch, before, before moving, and made a selection of the participants. He just do not allow bishops uh, of a genuine Orthodox faith to take part in this uh, uh, council. Uh, he ordained in Constantinople, especially for this purpose, to participate in the uh, council of interested persons. And uh, there was a pressure even on this selected uh, delegation at Byzantium. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Ivan, can I just intervene here? Because we have uh, a question, again, by Martin Burkhardt. I thank you for the active participation. Mm -hmm. So um, this is a historical question, and it goes like that. Was there an awareness in Byzantium at the time of the Second and the Fourth Crusades, that the excesses of the Crusaders were the other, if you will, schizophrenic side of that movement that Bernard of Clairvaux called Croissat des Cathedrales, so cathedral building, founding of universities, and what Lynn White called the Industrial Revolution of the Middle Ages. So in other words, were they aware of all these positive uh, you know, aspects of Catholic Christianity. Well, no signs of uh, such positive <laughs> development were announced by the, by the Crusaders. I'm sorry. And uh, on the other side, uh, Ottoman society, society and Ottoman rule 
was quite pragmatic. They were interested in collecting taxes mm -hmm. and to leave some freedom, mm -hmm. relative freedom, to uh, confessions. Uh, it is uh, due to the particular organization of Byzantine cultural and intellectual life that such a cultural catastrophe followed because uh, Byzantium had no idea of the university, of an independent academic community which has s uh, their own position in society, own, own funds, etc. In Byzantium, there, are, there were schools affiliated to the centers of power. And when these centers of power were destroyed, the higher education Collapsed. Uh, was destroyed as yeah, well. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, I'd like to now move to our participants who are based in what sounds like a very idyllic little village somewhere in France. Uh, thank you for participating. Uh, I'll introduce you very briefly again. So, uh, Ivan Folletti, you can wave. <laughs> um, is an associate professor in art history at Masaryk University in Brno and the head of the Center for Early Medieval Studies uh, there. Uh, he's also the editor-in-chief of a journal that might be familiar to many of you, uh, Convivium, uh, the, uh, which is a journal on the exchanges and interactions in the arts of medieval Europe, Byzantium, and the Mediterranean. Um, Ivan is also the director of the Hans Belting uh, Library. Uh, just a second. So uh, his, um, he specializes in the study of the historiography of Byzantine studies, something very relevant to what was mentioned uh, earlier, and in the art of Milan, Rome, and the Caucasus in late antiquity and in the early modern period. More specifically, he studies early Christian monuments from the liturgical, uh, liturgical and ritual point of view. In addition, he is interested in using social and anthropological approaches to exploring the impact of the period of migrations on the art around the Mediterranean Sea and on pilgrimage art in medieval Europe. Now, his presentation is going to be a joint presentation with Adrian Palladino, that you also saw, saw on the screen, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the Center for Early Medieval Studies um, at Masaryk University. His interests include the history of art history and art theory, as well as the study of late antique and early med uh, medieval material cultures. With Ivan Folletti, he recently published a historiographic study on the transformation of Byzantine art history through the impact of Russian emigres in Czechoslovakia and France. Again, something very relevant and touching on uh, uh, other presentations today. The title of the book is Byzantium or Democracy? Kondakov's Legacy in Immigration, the Institutum Konda, oh, the Kondakov's Institute, and Andre Grabar, 1925-1952. The book was published in 2020. Adrian is also preparing his new book, which is a, revi a revision of his PhD dissertation. So we're looking forward to your joint uh, presentation. So please go ahead. Can you hear us? Yes. Great. So thank you so much for the very kind introduction. Uh, this is already moving. Um, we really prepared this paper beforehand. So you'll see we'll be switching from one to the other. And we are really unhappy to not be with you. But as it was already mentioned by Clemena, we are presently in Conk in Rouergue, which is a wonderful place in France with a wonderful 11th century church, however, basically impossible to reach. So from here to Vienna, you have two and a half days of traveling. So it was impossible for us to travel so much because we have a current project here in Conk. So we are really sorry to not be with you uh, while the, the, the discussions are really challenging and it is not so easy to participate through the screen to it anyhow. Happy to be there. And yeah, one stuff which changed in my presentation, which is, Already 
bit time ago, I'm, I'm really full professor, but this happened between the organization of the conference and it's real, it's real happening. So, <laughs> no, but this is showing what, what COVID time did with us. Right? Well, it just shows how long this conference took to organize. <laughs> <laughs> one year ago, indeed, you know. <laughs> so I'm leaving the floor to Adrian to start beginning. Please, Adrian. Great. So thank you very much. I extend also my thanks to the organizers for this beautiful conference. And like Ivan, I would love to be there, but we will have to deal with this. And please let us know if you have some problems with the slides or the connection is not working, and if you can hear us well all the long of our speech. So you can see the presentation is entitled Mirroring the Past, Nomadic Art between Vienna, St. Petersburg, and Prague. 1918-1952, and we really tried to delve into the topic of Byzantium and Eurasia by one specific story that we will try to tell. And this story implies uh, one of the figures about which we already have spoken, Nikodim Pavlovich Kondakov, who uh, in February 1925 died in Prague. At this moment, he was already in emigration since several years, since five years. And uh, it was a whole period which indeed for Kondakov had started with the revolution of 1917, which was one of the most difficult moments of the career of the scholar. Uh, it was a figure who was extremely prolific all along of his career. We'll record some of his achievements. He published immensely, but in this last period, he published one single article. And the topic of this article and its title might not seem surprising at first, Les Costumes Orientaux à la Cour Byzantine, so the Oriental Costumes at the Byzantine Court. Uh, the title is not so surprising, but if we delve into the content of this article, we see that Kondakov devotes a major place in the transfer of textiles and their motifs by nomadic tribes to the Byzantine Court and to Byzantium in general. <clears throat> it's a topic that Kondakov had explored at the very beginning of his career, but then he had left aside uh, in the next 25 years. Thus, one of the questions that we would like to ask today is why coming back to these specific interests when being in immigration? And more interestingly as well, starting with Kondakov, we would like to ask why he is not the only scholar who is fascinated by the arts of the nomadic people, and especially after World War I, why scholars from very different cultural and national backgrounds, and especially in the place which is which was called Middle Europa, which is today Central Europe, were interested deeply into these topics. And therefore we have a presentation which will be um, in, three, uh, in this threefold uh, structure, which will first explore the reasons why uh, Kondakov decided to come back to this topic, especially during the time of his emigration in Prague. In the second part, uh, we will explore this notion of nomadic arts on the more broader Czechoslovak context with Seminarium Kondakovianum, another review, another review called Byzantino Slavica, and the more broad um, idea of the state. And in the last part, we'll extend this circle once again to look at the impact of such ideas brought by Russian emigres to the broader sphere, going from Prague to Vienna and to Paris. And for the very first part, I will leave the space to Ivan. Thank you so much, Adrian. So as you see, we can start immediately by becoming a nomad, which is, uh, by the way, a challenging title because Kandakov himself was feeling as being back a migrant and as a nomad at the very end of his career. So uh, I think in this floor, it's not necessary to repeat all what we know about Nikodim Pavlovich Kandakov, one of the leading figures in the construction of the Russian art history as such, and in medieval studies in particular, and obviously a great Byzantinist. What we can just remind are maybe essential steps, first of them, is this, this story of a man who starts as, as a serf of the Prince Trubetskoy, so serf of the family Trubetskoy, who is going through fundamental step, becoming one of the leading figure in the coeval Russian intelligentsia with private access to the imperial court and uh, with a real intellectual power. We should also remember Kandakov as the man who was teaching between Odessa and St. Petersburg at one first and impressive art historians in Russia in this period. And uh, what is also important to be reminded is that it should be seen as the man who, to a certain extent, constructed the intellectual framework of what Byzantium is in the 19th century. And especially uh, in traveling through all the Mediterranean, he reconstructed this puzzle of the Christian culture of Mediterranean, which he was seeing 
united by the phenomenon of, of Byzantium. What we can also say about him, and this is to me quite important, we already discussed it a bit, is that he was studying Eastern material, however, with a Western methodology. And uh, as it was already mentioned, he had several problems, both with the aesthetic and with the intellectual legacy of Byzantium and of Russia. Still, he was convinced that Byzantine studies are a patriotic duty. As you see in my slide, there's written this third row with a quotation mark, uh, with the interrogation quotation mark, because um, one of the questions which are quite interesting when dealing with Kandakov's legacy is to understand his interest in Byzantium, especially in the 60s and 70s, uh, in the 19th century. The turning point is this book, uh, The History of Byzantine Painting, which is published in 76 for the first time, and which is fitting perfectly well in all this period of reflection about what is the role of Russia with Byzantium. We heard a lot about this morning about it, but the, the Russo-Turkish world in the 70s, late 70s, 77, 78, seems to be the crucial moment where Kandakov is really entering the debate about the role of Byzantium into the construction of Russia. Now, why I'm mentioning the third Rome question? Because we are in the very same year when the text about the Rome third Moscow is republished by print. So we are really in a context of thinking about the role of Moscow and of Russia within the Byzantine legacy. And the last aspect we should point out is, um, and this is something we discussed a bit as well this morning, the question of the incredible up-to-date of the Russian culture around 1900. Um, Kandakov is a splendid international scholar with contact all around the world being deeply cosmopolitan. Obviously the word is a neologism, but I think he applies himself very well to Kandakov. From monumental art to icons, he was the leading figure of this period. Now, Strangely enough, in the 90s, he participates, or not strangely enough, logically enough, um, to something which is impressive. This is something which is constructed within the frame of what is happening with the Romanovs around 19, 1890. So after the death, the violent death, obviously, of Alexander II and what is arriving with Alexander III, there is this monumental publication, Ruski Drevnosti Pamiatnika Hiskustva, which is published over 10 years to show what is Russian culture. Now, it will be very challenging to discuss what are the subtitles because Ge Georgian medieval art, Armenian, whatever is part of this Russian huge vision of self. But more interesting for us is this volume of uh, 18 and 19, which is devoted to the art of the migrants from the steppe, so the nomadic art. Now, this is at this moment, more an isolated moment on the Kandakov's biography, um, while the majority of his research should be seen, I would say, densely in interaction with what Russia in this period is, what I do mean with it. I've already mentioned the first publication, Vizientinsky Iskustu of Iconography, which you see on the screen, but we can mention other of his major publications, such as the Iconographia Bogomati of 1914, or the, the very important book on the Iconography of the Christ, the book on Athos, Sinai, and so on. Kandakov was mainly dealing with monumental and monumental art on the one side, on the other, with manuscripts and painting on wood, so the so called icons. And all these topics were according to what we know in harmony with Kandakov's life within the Russian empire. So the topics were going directly to what was interesting for the society. Now, the breaking point is, as for many people we have seen already, the revolution and the successive migration. Kandakov left Odessa in 1920. So he was one of the figures ar which arrives to Istanbul, Constantinople, as a poor, because he lost everything he had, a migrant. Um, what is challenging in that is very, this very moment, um, being poor, he had not lost what we would call today his social capital. So in Constantinople, he was allowed to avoid the disinfection and all humiliating procedures in quarantines devoted to the migrants because he was having as his represented in this image, and I will be speaking about this image a bit later, I mean, at the very end, indeed, the Légion d'honneur. He was seen, uh, seen, he had the Légion d'honneur together with Ivan Bunin. Alexei already, already mentioned the fact that Kandakov was traveling with Ivan Bunin and his wife, 
both of them had the Legion of Honor and therefore had the privilege status while having lost large majority of the money and the owns they had. Uh, the story is even more challenging when looking to happen in the later decades. Kardakov, before arriving to Prague, as Alexei already mentioned it correctly, um, went to Bulgaria, to Sofia. In both cases, he was personally welcomed by the leading figures of these nations. So, Boris III in um, Sofia and Tomasz Garik Masaryk in Prague, Czechoslovakia. Um, in both cases, he was arriving as a person having a special status. At the same time, in both cases, he was arriving as a person who did something for the person who inviting him. On the one side, his engagement for the Bulgarian cause. Since 1900, he was writing to support Bulgarian political claims. Second, in Czechoslovakia, he had privileged personal interactions with President Masaryk. He was helping in the period Masaryk himself was a persona non grata within the Austro-Imperial Empire. Now, Kandakov is losing what he has in terms of economy. He has not anymore the money, but has a deep social intellectual capital which is promising him to be welcome everywhere he's coming. Now, the interesting aspect, and for us, this is the breaking point, are these two contracts, which are written in Prague in 1922 and 24, which we found in the archives of the Narodny um, Pisenitsu in Prague. They are showing that Kandakov was called to come to Prague, not in order to explore his previous topic of research, but mainly to work on Slavic, Slavic nomadic tribes. So, the question Adrian asked at the very beginning, why Kandakov was working on nomadic art, can find the first answer. This first answer is that the contract was asking him to work precisely on this topic. So very banal, he had the grant and he was obliged to work on this very topic. This is however not so easy. We should remind that Kandakov arrived and Adrian will speak about it in a few minutes, uh, within the frame of the so-called Russian action, Ruska Akce, Ruska Pomocna Akce, with the main goal of supporting Russian intellectuals. But Kandakov arrived also because these two men, Lubor Niederle and Yiri Polivka, called him specially because of the deep interest they had in the Kandakov studies of 1890s. So they were aware of the fact Kandakov was a man who worked already on the art of the nomadic tribes, this is one. Two, they were considering these topics as extremely interesting and challenging for Czechoslovakia as such. So on the one side, we have patrons who are interested in someone who will be speaking about an art which is relevant to them as well within the myth of the Slavic unity, knowing, and Adrian will speak about it as well, that Czechoslovakia is everything but a Slavic country. They are seven nations, big minorities, but anyhow, the myth is this is a Slavic country. Number two, um, or three, is Kandakov himself. And we have few traces in his diaries and a few other in the text he was preparing for the publication and he never published. And they were published after his death, actually. Um, these traces are showing us a man who, for the last time in his life, is challenging the destiny. He's trying to be up to date. So at this moment, arriving in Czechoslovakia, he's 77 years old, but still, He's trying to do a research which is relevant for his society. And this is putting us in an even larger framework and obviously in the framework of this conference is the question of Eurasianism. So we already spoke about Trubetsko this morning. Trubetsko was a personal friend for Kandakov for many reasons we can discuss later. And uh, we should imagine Kandakov surrounded by young intellectuals such as, such as Grigory Vernatsky, we will mention later, the big Vernatsky and other figures all involved in the Eurasian movement. Now in this context, nomadic tribes and their relative art is something which is becoming absolutely challenging and of a burning actuality for the old professor Nikari Pavlovich Kandakov. As you heard from Adrian, he died in 1925, few months only after his 80th birthday. And from the many promises, only few were realized in his personal life. But what he did opened a path for something even more challenging. And I'm letting the floor to Adrian. 
Thank you very much. So we have seen now uh, a trajectory of a man, Nikolim Kondakov, which represents a deep experience, personal experience, which it is, of course. But what we wish to do now in this second part is to try to understand the story of Kondakov and the story of the pupils of Kondakov within the larger frame of the cultural history of the times. And you can see the second part, which is entitled Seminarium Kondakovianum, Byzantine Slovakia, and Czechoslovakia in search of definition. As Ivan already mentioned, um, Kondakov must be replaced against the backdrop of an event which is unprecedented and extremely important for the formation of Czechoslovakia. Uh, this larger phenomenon, Ivan already spoke about it, is the so-called Russian action, which was promoted uh, mainly by the first president of Czechoslovakia, Tomasz Masaryk, but also by the first prime minister, Karel Kramash. The Russian action, which is something which started around the 20s, 1921, had one explicit ambition. And this explicit ambition was to create in Czechoslovakia a true epicenter of Russian emigre intelligentsia. So the idea was uh, not to acculturate this person, to assimilate them, but to permit these persons, namely to university teachers, to students, to complete their education, being in immigration in Czechoslovakia. And as I already said, the intention was not to really assimilate them, to make them enter into the Czechoslovak society, but to create a real diaspora, and to a certain extent, elite diaspora, which could then return to Russia after the normalization of the situation. At this moment, uh, it was still very much hoped that the situation was norm will normalize and that this elite will return with very strong ties to the newly born Czechoslovakia. For this purpose, um, high schools, universities, a lot of other educational institutions were created in order to promote really the Russian education within the newly born country. You can see here uh, up one of these Russian schools, which was uh, created, as well as one of these um, identity certificates created for uh, the Russian emigrees. Some uh, persons were able also to receive, for example, talented PhD students, fellowships in order to go be trained in Czechoslovakia, and other cultural activities, as well as institutions, were supported by this Russian action. So we really must see this extremely, to a certain extent, Russophile background or Slavophile background, which is leading the way to what I wish to speak about now, which is namely one of the institutes which was supported also by the Russian action, which is the Kondakov Institute. At the beginning, this institute is created as a group of persons to celebrate the memory of Kondakov shortly after his death. Uh, firstly named the Seminarium Kondakovianum, later renamed the Institutum Kondakovianum. The goal of this group at the beginning is really to pursue the goals and the research of the master of Kondakov. Uh, effectively, however, Seminarum Kondakovianum, the journal which will be created, as well as the Institutum itself, will become one of the most incredible center for Byzantine studies, Byzantine art history and archaeology, and what we will call today perhaps Western Asia studies, namely the space of Eurasia. Um, as, our, as you can see here, um, the Institute itself was promoted mainly through a journal, which was founded, you can see here, the first issue of 1927, Seminarium Kondakovianum, as well as immediately two series, which start to be uh, published and which are extremely symptomatic for the two directions that the Institute would want to study. On the one hand, you can see here on the left, the book series Skitika, which as the name can indicate, is dedicated really to nomadics, nomadic arts and culture. In the description is specified uh, all the peoples from the Pannonian Plains to the Pacific Ocean. So really this huge space of Eurasia and in which we can just remind that uh, Mikhail Rostovtsev wrote the first issue of this book. We'll come back to this figure later. And the second uh, book series which also is symptomatic called Zografica, which is devoted to religious devotional paintings, mainly on wood and mainly what we be called here icons. So these two interests of study are also reflected very deeply inside of the first issues of Seminarium Kondakovianum. I put here just a patchwork of, the, of some of the images in the first issues of Seminarium, where you can see this deep interest for fibulae, for textiles, for icon painting, as well as other manifestations. You can see here the beautiful uh, Neresi. Um, 
the main figures which are promoting uh, the articles and writing in Sarev Seminarum and in the book series are interested mainly in nomadic art. So we've seen the fibule, and you can quote the figures of Nikolai Beliaev, Dmitry Rasovsky, but also more important even for the purpose that we wish to, to study here, the figure of Mikhail Rostovtsev, as well as the great historian Vernadsky, uh, who we can remind also had participated with Trubetskoy and Savitsky in the very formulation of the theory of Eurasian history or the history of Russia in a Eurasiatic perspective. What is also quite challenging is that in order to engage to a certain degree with society, possibly as part of the fact that the Russian action was slowly waning, uh, activities for the large audience were also organized. You can see here the image of one of the first exhibition of Russian icons in Europe, which was made uh, in Prague in 1932 and promoted deeply by uh, the, 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 the Czechoslovak uh, supporters and by the Kondakov Institute uh, in 1932. And uh, you can see also other activities which are promoted, such as workshops of icon painting, animal production, and others. By the way, you can see here uh, an image of the lady we spoke about this morning, the princess Yashvil, painted by Nesterov, uh, who was really an important member, not only in the actual functioning of the institute itself, but also in the finding of financing and so on. So we have this incredible lady to which we maybe can come back later. So to sum up the activities of the institute, uh, we have two aspects. On the one hand, this proposal of a new narrative for the pre-modern Russian culture, and on the other hand, a new reading of the Russian past and cultural heritage in what can be considered as a much larger framework, which is really uniting Europe and Asia. And the scholars of Seminarium Kondakovianum, perhaps mirroring the last uh, or the late Kondakov, were finding in nomadic art the perfect historical mirror for the moment of unification or unity that they were experiencing to a certain extent. What is more interesting even is that these aspects were relevant not only for the nostalgic Russian emigres, but also for the newly born Czechoslovakia. You see a journal which was promoted by the state itself and which started to be published in 1929, and which is clearly stating the goal of a journal called Byzantino Slavica. I will read very quickly the quotation. In 1928, the president of the Czechoslovak Republic, Tomasz Gary Masaryk, who had thoroughly investigated in his own scholarly work the Byzantine element in the mentality of the Slavic world, gave impetus to the creation in Prague of a special organization for Byzantino Slavic studies. The latter was set up not only to gather and support Czech scholarship in the field, but also to facilitate cooperation between Slavs and non Slavs. The idea of Byzantino Slavica was really to unite uh, not only the relation with what were the heirs of Byzantium but between all Slavs. And it was extremely important for Czechoslovakia. Ivan already mentioned that we have not only Slavic elements, in fact, only a minority of Slavic elements to a certain extent, but also Ruthenians, Polish, Germans, and so on, which were forming this huge, um, this huge uh, entity. What is therefore also symptomatic is that while the pan-Slavic element is extremely important in Byzantino Slavica and perhaps even more visible then in Seminarium Kondakovianum, uh, we have also another journal which starts to appear, Germano Slavica, which is dedicated to the interactions between Slavic and Germanic cultures in Central Europe, in Czechoslovakia, and beyond. So we have a huge moment where, by state decision, all these different parts historically were, are seen to be coming together. What is constructed thus, inside of the scholarly perspective, going from Seminarium Kondakovianum, to the other endeavors is a new state of Czechoslovakia constructed as a bridge between East and West. Uh, what we could even say when we were reading Masaryk's words is that Czechoslovakia to a certain extent is admitting an identity as being a multicultural and multi-ethnical construction. The Slavic component has to remain of course dominant because of this ideal, uh, which is by the way an aspect which is very problematic for the later history of the country. But the idea is that we are in front of a state which is constructed by this very diversity and by this very connection. 
and we could speak even about the Cyril or Methodian tradition, but I will not delve into it because I see that the time is running. So what is paradoxical that inside of the Czechoslovakia that we have seen being constructed by scholars and politicians, and scholars and politicians in the case of Masaryk are the very same entity, the transcultural Eurasiatic perspective promoted by figures such as Rostovtsev within Seminarium is ideally completing these ambitions. So we are at a moment where the interests of the Russian enemies <clears throat> and the more large interests of a newly born country are really merging into one extremely fertile and ambitious direction. And I will leave the words to the last part again to Ivan. And uh, so this is bringing us to the following step because what is challenging as well in this Czechoslovakian perspective, which is somehow assuming to certain level, the transnational role of an empire is that this country was a democratic one, however. So the idea was not to reappropriate the Byzantine heritage within its, let's say, autocratic dimension, but more the idea of an empire or a country which is going beyond the nations and beyond the borders to a certain extent. This is a paradox, but this is a paradox which is even more challenging when looking to what is the Russian immigration in this period. There is this plan which is showing the, the map of the world with all the major Russian communities of immigrants. So you see them basically everywhere around the globe. More challenging is that it's even hard to say where the Russian immigrant community really is in a sense. But we have example of very famous migrants in Greece living contemporary in Prague, Berlin, Prague, Paris, Paris, Prague. They are just moving between different countries, creating a truly cosmopolitan diaspora. And this is particularly visible for Seminarium Kondakovian itself. Georgi Vernatsky, who will be acting as a director of the Institute from Yale. Uh, Ostrogorsky, who's one of the main figure in the first part of the Love Seminarium from Belgrade. And obviously the other aspect is that some of the missions of Seminarium are happening beyond the borders of Central Europe, such as the excavation in Dura Europos in 1932, you see the photograph Cumon with Rostovtsev together at Dura Europos. So just to say that we are facing a mirror of what Russian cosmopolitan emigration is at this very moment. The Czechoslovakian institutions are clearly merged through the diaspora uh, within a larger world. This idea of Byzantium and of the art of the Slavic tribes going beyond the borders is then arriving also to other, and it's amplified through other figures beyond these borders. One of them, and one of the maybe more appealing one, is certainly André Grabar, or André Grabar, if you prefer. As you know, he was pupil of Kandakov, and he moved basically in the same moment from Odessa to Sofia, where he decided to investigate the art of Bulgarian uh, Middle Ages. Very challenging is the case he's proposing. Grabar's Bulgarian art is an art which is belonging to Byzantium while being outside of the borders of the empire. And he's just arguing that art is something going beyond any borders. No borders can stop the movement of art. How impressive for a man who left Russia, stay for a while in Bulgaria before becoming the legend of medieval studies in France, firstly in Strasbourg, and then reaching the very prestigious chair of the Collège de France in 1936. So an impressive figure who is projecting, I would use the word of global perspective on Byzantine art while moving with the, uh, the immigration. What is also important to remind is that the politic of French state is totally different from the one of Czechoslovakia. So no creation of small diasporas, on the very contrary, acculturation is the idea promoted by the French state. Das Grabar, if we wish to become, what he wished obviously, professor at university, should become French. He's thus becoming already 1928 French citizens to later uh, participate to the war as a French soldier. Not very heroic, to be honest, but still, he participated to the war as a French soldier. Now, in this context, it's extremely challenging to read uh, the grammar. I'm sorry, Ivan, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but could we please come soon to a close? Because we are running a little bit out of time. 
Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you because this sounds like a real story, exactly like I, I wanted our case studies to look, and it's very interesting to listen to it, but you know, we're a bit short of time. We are speaking in 33 minutes and 23 seconds, and I don't have <laughs> five minutes. Oh, okay, okay, as, as you like. Okay, go, go, go ahead. I mean, go fast, but just that we are controlling the time very carefully. So it's <laughs> 33, 33, 33 now. So just um, the sent fast is published within the frame of Senere Kontakokianum, and he's speaking about, let's say, an Eastern Slavonico Byzantine image acculturated to the West. So this is about cultural transfer of images traveling from the East to the West. This is about the movement of ideas from East to West. And this is part of the vision Rabar is proposing of the world, a vision which we can see in a much larger context uniting Europe the Slavic cultures of Asia. I would just like to remind that the son of Oleg Rabar, of Rabar, of Andrei, Oleg Rabar, will move even beyond the ideas of the father, becoming one of the main specialists, this time in the United States of America, of Islamic art, enlarging the frameworks of what has been analyzed by this father. Now, in this very large cosmopolitan world, we should see other small examples and really going to conclude. One of them is, for example, the figure of Wolfgang Bohn, who is publishing in the Seminario of 1933. More interesting, this article, which is presenting once more this big Eurasiatic topic, is linked with the series of letters which were recently published. Uh, Bohn is Telling the story of a Vienna which has been international and which is now brutally become Jew. So he's feeling like becoming useless in this very space. But he's with this transnational gaze participating to the story of the Institute of Nikola Pedagogy in Prague. The rest of the story is a series of tragedies. Firstly, München, 1938, with an uh, institute which is start trying to leave Prague within the Pius Protectorate. They are moving to Belgrade while Czechoslovakia is invaded by Nazi Germany. But terribly enough, the life of the institute in Belgrade is destroyed by the war itself. Nazi are reaching Belgrade and the rest of the institute is going back to Czechoslovakia, but deciding not to produce any scholarship the rest of the period. And the gaze which has been proposed by the MGV communities, the Russian MGV communities all around the world, is suddenly becoming extremely unpopular in the years which will follow, especially after 1948, when Czechoslovakia will enter the Eastern Bloc. The white MGV organization will lose any interest and will be simply closed in 1952 within a world divided by the iron quality in dust, the legacy of Kandakov will be interrupted. And this extraordinary reflection about medieval culture as something going beyond the borders, as about Byzantium as a place in between, but also beyond, more than a bridge, will be closed for a while in Central Europe. Um, what is however interesting from our perspective, I would say, is definitely the fact that this heritage had transformed the way in thinking about Byzantium as a fluid identity. This is not anymore the Russian national Byzantium. This is the Byzantium of the cosmopolitan Russian immigration. And I am concluding showing you the cover of this book. We, have, we wanted to speak with you before publishing it. Finally, the book was published before our conference, but this is the central notion we developed in this book, which is called Byzantium and Democracy, which is that arriving to democratic countries, Russian immigrants transformed their way of seeing both Byzantium and Eurasia. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks to both of you. Uh, as, as I just said, you know, I, I thought that all these case studies that people are presenting here, you know, one of the ways of seeing them is exactly like a story you tell that illustrates important aspects of the topic that we are dealing with. And I thought that this was great. You know, you're talking about people that we are all familiar with, but you sort of see the way they're moving from one place to another. 
As I'm Bulgarian, you know, I never realized that Kondakov was supporting Bulgaria's political claims, you see? <laughs> so, and you see all these people moving, you know, from one place to another and then ending up in Prague and in Paris and so on. And you see how this changes the whole, the whole landscape. It changes them, it changes the places as well. And it changes our understandings about Byzantium and Eurasia and so on. So I, I thought this was great. Now, if um, you have any comments, questions, please. Uh, yes, Professor Ivanov, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my question concerns uh, the, um, uh, the background of President Masaryk's decision um, about the Byzantine studies in, Czech, Czech, in Czechoslovakia. So uh, if we compare two neighboring Catholic Slavic nations, Poles and Czechs. So the Poles hate Byzantium ardently. They don't want Byzantine studies whatsoever, completely. Uh, because for them, of course, Byzantium stands for the hated uh, Russian domination. Um, so Czechoslovakia, Czech lands have nothing to do, well, for all practical purposes, with Byzantium. Still, uh, Masaryk decides that to uh, invest money in, into Byzantine project. Is it somehow connected to the um, idea that the Czechos Czech lands should alienate themselves from the German domination? Um, my idea uh, comes from the um, intimation which came to me uh, while reading the memoirs of Nikolai Andreev, the secretary of the Institut Kondokovianum, who um, does not try to hide his uh, hatred of George Ostrogorsky, exactly because Ostrogorsky was taught in Munich and came to Prague as a, um, more or less, as a representative of, of German uh, Byzantine studies. So uh, do we know anything about Masaryk's uh, decision, Masaryk's idea? There are actually two ideas which are known, which is the general framework of Masaryk's thinking. So already as a scholar in the 20s he's writing about Russia as about something which should belong to Europe and as Czechoslovakia as the ideal bridge. So he had the general idea of Russia being the place uh, which should be attracted to Europe and to the West by Czechoslovakia. So this was the general framework of Masaryk's thinking. But then we should have in mind at least three aspects. One, when discussing about the name of the new nation, one of the options was Great Moravia. So not Czechoslovakia, but Great Moravia was one of, I mean, never seriously discussed, but still, we find an article in a journal which was arguing, let's use this name. Why? Because we have the serial methodian tradition which is uniting all Czechs, Moravians, and Slovaks, obviously. So we did this Slavocentric heritage. Byzantium is playing a crucial role. And we went through all the, um, let's say, historical general publication in the 20s, where it was argued strongly that Czechoslovakia is based somehow on the Greek-Slavic tradition. So this is the second aspect, just to be highlighted. And then there is a third point, and I think Adrian would like to speak then about the German qu Germany question, which is that uh, actually um, the arrival of the Russian immigration within the Ruska Act, the main idea was to unite really Russia with Czechoslovakia with special interactions. But I don't know if they really imagined what the flourishing of cultural life this will create in Prague. And since Byzantino Slavica is reacting in 28 to what is already happening since seven years, I believe that Masaryk simply realized that this new way of seeing Byzantium, this Byzantium as a transcultural entity which arrived with Russian immigrants, is something which can contribute to compose this new country which is full of diversity. If, if you consider that they were really one million of Germans, half million of Jews, they were hundreds of thousands of Hungarians, of Polish, Czechs and Slovaks, so in all this multiplicity, you need somehow um, a unity. And never Czechoslovakia was trying to become Byzantium. But part of the narrative, a narrative which is going beyond the borders of nations, strict to sensu, was, I believe, very appealing for Masaryk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. yeah, perhaps about the question of uh, the, the Seminarum Kondakorianum's relationship with German scholars. Uh, I think that the, the hate for Ostrogorsky, the Andrea for Ostrogorsky question is quite interesting. In the book, he states it as well. And we have also other letters uh, which made us have a clear review on the situation. And it seems that it's not only because he is uh, Germanophile or Germanocentric that there is this hate, but also for very concrete actions. Ostrogorsky at a certain point sends a letter which almost uh, could have killed Andreev, especially at the times of the protectorate. There is this whole quiproquo history with Ostrogorsky sending a letter and uh, Andreev being saved only through the in intervention of uh, the Prince Schwarzenberg. So we have really this, this moment also of struggle between individual personalities, which is, I don't think, related only to the, the cultural background. And I say this also because they have enormous amounts of at least from this scholarly perspective, let's say, interactions with German scholars. We have letters from Kurt Weizmann, we have letters with Shigovsky even, who was very against uh, the, 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 let's say, ideas of the Russian emigre groups, but nonetheless is corresponding with Seminarium it's as a scholarly institution, and it's becoming even a honorary member in order to support financially the institution. So it's, it's a very tricky moment, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's I also a matter of money, you know. Uh, we went through all the, I mean, really economical question of the Institute, discovering that basically um, the sell, the person who was selling the publication of the Institute, and this was not a small amount of money, was um, in um, Germany. This was in Dresden. And now when in 41, the, or in 40, the Institute was split in two parts, one Prague part and one in Belgrade, the question was who will take the money? And Ostrogorsky was probably used by Razovsky, who was in Belgrade, to, to take the money. While Andreev, which Schwarzenberg were in the Prague side, telling, no, we wish the money. And then arrived all this story with the executive letter, which arrived to the SS. So this was very dangerous. But there is an unpublished uh, document at Columbia University Library, uh, which is actually the longest version of Andre Andreev's memoirs uh, on only the, the period of Prague, which is very illuminating because there are much more details than in the published memoirs later. So this is something which I had the privilege to, to read at Columbia University Library, and this really put many new ends in, in this debate, yes. Thank you, thank you very much. What a, what a nice and how well the whole uh, uh, joint talk uh, actually works. Thank you very much. I think we now have to move to our next talk, which is by Andrei Sashaumi, who is uh, a professor in history at the University of Pech. Uh, between 2018 and 2020, he was the director of the Institute of History at uh, the university. Um, he's generally a scholar who's known for his work in early modern Western and Russian political thought and political iconography. I have myself used his work in political iconography and I know that uh, you know, he, uh, he has published quite a lot uh, in that. He's held many um, important academic positions, has received academic honors and so on. I'll just mention uh, several of the institutes where He's held fellowships at St. John's College in Oxford, then twice at Edinburgh. We met the first time there years ago. Um, then also the Royal Netherlands Institute for Advanced Studies in, uh, in Holland, where he was a Magyar fellow. And uh, I think I should leave you now some time for your talk. <laughs> Thank you very much, Clemena, first of all, for the invitation and uh, also for the kind uh, introduction. And uh, uh, my uh, presentation <coughs> uh, will have many intersections with uh, that of previous speakers, especially with uh, that of Professor Ivanov and uh, Professor Lidov. And uh, to, uh, uh, to some extent, it will be like a prelude uh, to these uh, uh, previous papers because I will end where, uh, uh, where uh, they uh, uh, started. So if I can have the uh, presentation online. Okay, so 
quite a long title and uh, quite a long subtitle. And I will begin uh, with the second part of the main uh, title, that is with, with the late 18th century uh, British uh, perspective. And uh, in the late 18th uh, century, uh, exactly in 1791, uh, the spring of 1791 in uh, uh, parliamentary uh, debates uh, in London was dominated by the so-called uh, Ochakov crisis. So the whole spring was about it. And during this uh, uh, Ochakov crisis, several uh, caricatures uh, appeared. One of them you can see here. Uh, a different version uh, was uh, shown by uh, Professor uh, Lidov. It has the title An Imperial uh, Stride, and uh, I'm not going to details to analyze it, uh, just to uh, give some uh, uh, interesting ideas. Of course, uh, what is obvious is that uh, it shows Catherine the Great with one of her uh, feet uh, on uh, Russia and with uh, the another standing on the top of the Hagia Sophia on uh, the uh, crescent. And uh, below her, there are European crowned heads, and in the bubbles, uh, the inscriptions uh, uh, have a secondary meaning, which is quite frivolous, because uh, uh, this uh, secondary meaning is provided uh, by uh, uh, the image itself, because uh, there are male crowned heads, and looking under the skirt of uh, Catherine uh, the Great and saying different things like, for example, Louis uh, XVI, the French uh, king, never saw anything like uh, this. And uh, uh, all, of the, all of these utterances, except for one, which is uh, uttered by Selim III, the Turkish sultan, uh, who can be seen on the uh, right side. So this is the only one which doesn't have uh, a political meaning, but a plainly frivolous sexual meaning, uh, saying that the whole Turkish army uh, would not uh, uh, satisfy uh, her. So, uh, the Ochakov crisis, uh, of course, uh, in 1791, it was quite uh, an unexpected uh, uh, move in uh, British politics that uh, uh, after th it was after three years that the Russian, uh, when the Russian uh, occupied the port of uh, Ochakov, which is uh, at the uh, mouth of the Dniester ri uh, River, it was taken by the Russians from the uh, Ottomans, but uh, Mm, uh, it took three years for the British government uh, to worry about this uh, expansion because in 1791, somehow, suddenly, they realized that it would, um, uh, it would pose a threat to uh, uh, British interest and to British uh, interest in the East. And uh, uh, the Ochakov crisis is considered by some historians the real beginning of the Eastern question. And it is true if we take into account that uh, uh, the Eastern question became a real balance of power uh, issue. Uh, I give uh, another source, not just caricatures, but uh, printed uh, uh, sources, and uh, namely one. There was a weekly periodical called The World, and uh, uh, in uh, spring, beginning from April the 4th until the 6th of May, a series of articles was presented in this uh, 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 journal. Uh, presenting the history of Russia from the very beginning uh, to 1791. And uh, one section from the um, 6th of May issue reads, uh, and I highlighted and I colored the most important things, that uh, uh, suddenly the British uh, uh, considered the Russian expansion uh, uh, against the Ottoman Empire a real threat and uh, uh, that Russia not just uh, wants a place uh, uh, which, uh, uh, which uh, she deserves in uh, the group of the great powers, but uh, uh, becomes a kind of uh, dictatress of uh, Europe, and uh, uh, Russia uh, wants a kind of uh, universal dominion. A universal dominion was a cliché of balance of power rhetoric from the late 17th and early 18th century, because at that time it was Louis XIV who was accused of, uh, uh, in European balance of law literature, for striving for such universal dominion, and the remedy was seen, uh, of course, in uh, uh, the restoration of the balance uh, of power, and in uh, uh, forthcoming slides I will just just a very short uh, insight into the Russian perspective uh, and then to the British retrospective of the, uh, of the Eastern uh, uh, question. It's not that uh, visible, unfortunately. So uh, uh, everyone here in this room is familiar uh, with what the Eastern question uh, was. 
uh, from the short-term Russian perspective, we can uh, single out the Treaty of Kuchuk Energy, uh, which gave certain and rights to the Russian Empire uh, uh, over the Orthodox population of the Ottoman Empire, which uh, uh, these rights the Russian government uh, interpreted as a, a, a right of protectorate over the Orthodox population, which of course was denied by the Ottoman government. Uh, of course, uh, there is another, uh, then can be another dating of the Eastern question, which is the Greek project, uh, and we have heard a lot about uh, it from Professor Ivanov, which uh, designed the division of the uh, Ottoman Empire, but the uh, central point of it, of course, was the con conquest of uh, uh, Constantinople, and uh, Professor Ivanov also uh, uh, made a reference uh, uh, in connection with the project uh, to the uh, name giving of uh, the, the second grandson of Catherine the Great, who was baptized as Constantine, and also showed the medal, which I'm going to show uh, later on, unfortunately, in a much worse uh, uh, quality, that even a medal was uh, uh, struck to commemorate the birth of uh, 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 Grand Duke Constantine with an inscription on it back to Byzantium and showing the uh, Hagia Sophia with a cross on its uh, cupola. But uh, uh, really, <clears throat> the Greek project, uh, the Greek project came in to, uh, uh, came to be regarded as an important matter by the Greek government during the uh, russo turkish uh, war, and uh, in 1791, uh, as I mentioned, it was perceived as a uh, real threat to the Europeans' balance of power, at least by the uh, British uh, government. Here is another very interesting cartoon, and again, I don't have too much time to go uh, into details of it. Uh, the main idea behind the cartoon is like in the imperial stride, because it shows Catherine the uh, Great in a position uh, of a, a stride. And I was really looking for the proper English expression. I think I, f I, I hope I found uh, a polite one. What is happening here? Uh, that is, Catherine the Great uh, is, brewing, uh, is uh, breaking the wind, and uh, the, uh, in the gas, Pachomkin's name is written, and the figure on the top uh, uh, and the top left corner is the Grand uh, Turk. But uh, the real political message can be uh, seen uh, on the uh, in the bottom lines. Uh, which says that uh, uh, the, emperor, uh, the empress only wants to uh, secure her uh, uh, back frontiers and then we stretch over the Baltic uh, Sea, uh, uh, over the Black Sea, then embrace uh, the Baltic and then we'll deluge uh, the, whole Ottoman, uh, the whole Ottoman Empire. And of course there are uh, again uh, uh, again inscriptions uh, which are uh, is sometimes frivolous, sometimes even rude, uh, concerning uh, uh, Catherine uh, the, uh, the Great. And <clears throat> as for the uh, British retrospective of the Ochakov crisis, also from the same uh, written source from the uh, periodical uh, called The uh, World, in 1791, uh, uh, this uh, uh, periodical conceived uh, the Treaty of Kuchuk uh, Karnaji that uh, it was clearly that uh, uh, the Russians uh, uh, wanted uh, to go further and uh, soon the Russians arm will uh, uh, threaten the wall of uh, uh, Constantinople. And uh, uh, what is uh, written here in the quotation, it's, uh, it really touches the heart of the issue we are uh, discussing uh, here, Eurasia, uh, uh, Russia, and the uh, Ottoman, Ottoman Empire, and uh, the, uh, the roots of this uh, question uh, in the uh, past. Okay, uh, now moving to the uh, perspective from within, uh, I have to start from the middle of the 17th uh, uh, century, namely with Russia's self-perception self, uh, uh, self uh, in the Orthodox uh, world, uh, because up to the middle of the 17th century, Russia considered herself as the only territory of true Orthodoxy and even true uh, Christianity. But uh, suddenly, uh, in the middle of the 17th century, this uh, uh, perception uh, changed, mainly due to, uh, due to uh, the Eastern uh, Patriarch, the Eastern Church uh, hierarchs, 
uh, who persuaded Tsar Alexis to become the protector and the liberator of Orthodox Christians living under uh, foreign rule. And uh, uh, this kind of new position uh, was accepted by uh, Tsar Alexis. And uh, this new position, for example, was reflected in a, a letter of uh, uh, the Patriarch of Jerusalem, uh, Paisi, uh, calling uh, Tsar Alexis a new Constantine. And from the middle of the 17th century, uh, in various uh, ways, uh, we can uh, detect the growth of the cult of Constantine the Great in the uh, uh, Russian Empire. One way of this growth of this card was that various relics attributed to Constantine the Great were transferred uh, to Russia. And the second important point was in imagery, uh, the so to say, the, the so-called Constantine uh, imagery. And these two phenomena uh, were two sides uh, of the same coin, uh, closely connected with uh, the newly uh, born idea that Russia uh, was the protector and liberator of Orthodox living under Ottoman rule. And uh, this, kind of, uh, uh, this kind of perception uh, uh, connected with the name of Constantine had clear an anti-Ottoman and hence an anti-Islamic edge uh, uh, to it. Uh, what kind of uh, motives are important within the, so to say, uh, 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 Constantine imagery? Uh, the motives goes back uh, to the legend when he defeated his uh, enemy Maxentius, that uh, a divine sign appeared, that is the shining, uh, uh, that is the cross in the shining sun, and, uh, and uh, the inscription in uh, Latin, uh, in this sign you shall win. And this Constantine uh, imagery uh, became very uh, uh, popular, became observable uh, from the middle of the uh, 17th century onwards, first in Ukrainian uh, and then in Russian uh, engravings, and not only engravings, but even on uh, Russian uh, uh, military banners. For example, when Peter the Great uh, uh, embarked on his campaigns against the Ottoman Empire in 1711, uh, uh, the, the banners uh, had the same inscription in Russian, of course, uh, on, on his uh, uh, banners. So, uh, taking uh, Constantinople uh, in a long-term perspective in Russian, Russian Panegyric literature, uh, we have to begin with uh, uh, Simeon Polotsky's Russian Eagle, uh, which was a, uh, a huge work, a huge literary work presented uh, 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 presented on the presentation of the heir uh, to the throne, Tsarevich Alexis, on the 1st of uh, September, which was, by the way, the beginning of the new year, before uh, 1700. And uh, this work, uh, uh, as I mentioned, um, was a huge literary work combining uh, prosaic uh, parts and various uh, uh, types of verses. Uh, but in effect, as to its content, it was a panegyric to Tsar Alexis and uh, uh, Tsarevich Alexis. And uh, as the introduction to the work uh, reads, the purpose uh, of the work was to show how the Russian eagle nowadays radiates the rays of virtue in the sun and what kind of a zodiacal spiritual journey Tsarevich Alexis has to accomplish, who is called the newly appeared son, and uh, in, in uh, various parts of this uh, uh, work in the Russian Eagle, both the Tsar and the Tsarevich are explicitly compared uh, uh, to the uh, son. Uh, uh, the, the Russian Eagle, this work contains two devices. The device in early modern uh, uh, symbolism uh, had two important uh, uh, elements, two important parts, an image and a uh, motto. Uh, it differed from the emblem in a sense that the emblem had a third part uh, uh, that is an explanation, uh, either a prosaic or in a verse-like explanation. And taken together, taken together the devices and uh, the written word, the written text of the Russian eagle, we can say that the whole world, the Russian eagle, comprised uh, an emblem. So there is one main emblem on the uh, left side, uh, 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 or a main, main device, uh, uh, saying that he has placed his dwellings uh, in the sun, and there is an auxiliary device, rejoices like a hero, completing his journey. And uh, these are the two uh, devices which really set the tone and serve as a conceptual framework uh, for the uh, uh, for the. Uh, written uh, material of the work. And it is very interesting that uh, 
the face of the mounted lancer, which is of course uh, Saint George, the face of the mounted lancer has the countenance uh, of Tsar Alexis. So uh, the uh, uh, comparison is really uh, visible. So now let's move uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the spiritual journey of the heir to the throne, that is Tsar Alexis. Uh, so uh, in the work uh, that Tsar Alexis makes this spiritual journey across the signs of the uh, uh, zodiac, he goes through uh, each and every sign of the uh, zodiac, uh, and uh, there is an image uh, accompanying uh, uh, the signs of the zodiac, and there is a verse uh, in each case, and I think the best uh, uh, the best case when uh, this uh, uh, topic which uh, concerns us uh, appears in uh, the uh, in the uh, science Sagittarius when Tsar Alexis is clearly uh, called a uh, son compared to the son and it is uh, uh, and it is said Alexis you are expected by the whole Europe and Asia to come and likewise you are expected by the city of uh, uh, the city of Constantine uh, this uh, uh, imagine, uh, imagery, uh, of course, that uh, the, the Tsar is compared uh, to uh, Constantine and uh, there is a mission to take back Constantinople from the Ottoman uh, 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 Turks, appears in a panegyric literature uh, towards the late 17th century when, for example, uh, Peter the Great uh, went on his uh, tour in uh, a great embassy uh, to Western Europe, uh, his entourage uh, were uh, given uh, uh, printed uh, sheets of a verse in different languages, Greek, Latin, and German, and uh, uh, it was entitled The Invincible Russian Monarch, and just two important points uh, from this uh, uh, from these words. Uh, Peter uh, was described as the strong king in Europe and Asia, waging a godly war against the Saracens, and a belief was expressed uh, in the verse that he would take back Constantinople uh, from the uh, Ottomans. Uh, and now moving uh, uh, to uh, the next, uh, uh, towards the end of the uh, presentation. So uh, that is uh, the Ode uh, of uh, Djerjavino, the taking of Ismail, uh, which was written in 1791. Ismail uh, was an, uh, an Ottoman fort fortress on the Danube, about uh, 80 kilometers uh, uh, from uh, the uh, shore of the Black uh, Sea. It was thought to be an impregnable uh, uh, fortress. It was defended approximately by 35,000 uh, uh, Ottoman uh, soldiers. And when it was taken in seven, at the end of 1790, uh, Gerjavin wrote uh, this ode. It was published a bit later, but what is important for us that the victory presented uh, was presented in a traditional symbolism. The sun and the eagle representing, of course, Russia, and the moon, of course, representing uh, the uh, Ottoman Empire. Uh, not Constantinople uh, is mentioned yet, but the Turkish name Istanbul is uh, mentioned here. If we go uh, further, it is interesting that uh, the, uh, Catherine the Great uh, is described in a manner of an uh, ancient uh, goddess flying through rosy uh, sunrise uh, who throws glitters on the uh, Bosphorus. And uh, uh, we can also uh, encounter a very uh, interesting uh, part in uh, this ode, uh, which is a clear reference uh, to uh, Constantine's mission, that is uh, the mission of uh, Catherine's uh, uh, grandson, that uh, Athens should be restored to Athena and uh, uh, Constantinople to uh, uh, Constantine. Clearly, uh, the political message associated with uh, the uh, uh, grandson is described here. And when uh, he was born, I mean, uh, 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 Grand Duke uh, Constantine. Of course, several uh, verses were uh, composed on this occasion, and in the, in the uh, verse of Vasily Prevtrov, he is clearly referred as uh, Constantine uh, the Great. Here uh, is uh, the image, but in a much worse quality, unfortunately, uh, which was struck uh, when uh, uh, Constantine was born in 1779. Uh, we have three uh, figures, three female figures, 
uh, they are the allegorical personifications of uh, the most important theological virtues of uh, faith, charity, and hope from the uh, right uh, to the uh, left. And it is written up then that see me, that is with days, uh, of course, Constantinople will be uh, retaken. And we can see the uh, Hagia Sophia uh, near them with a cross uh, on the uh, top. And uh, to conclude, uh, all, these, uh, all these plans were quite uh, uh, clear to the British uh, government in 1779 from uh, the correspondence of the British ambassador, James uh, Harris. So all the most important points connected with uh, uh, the issue of uh, uh, the Greek project and establishing a new empire uh, in the European uh, territories, the former Byzantine Empire, and to place uh, Grand Duke Constantine uh, on the throne of this empire, uh, are uh, clearly present in two letters sent uh, back to London by uh, the ambassador. Uh, here again, the. Uh, the most important uh, thing uh, uh, that uh, this present idea uh, is so much, uh, 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 so much occupying uh, the Empress uh, that uh, uh, she wants a new empire in the East uh, with a capital at Athens or Constantinople. And only one question left, and I'm going to uh, conclude on that. Uh, we can raise the question why Athens, uh, why Athens comes uh, uh, to the picture in Gershavin's ode and in uh, the ambassador's uh, letter that establishing a new empire in the East at Athens or Constantinople with uh, its capital. Probably the explanation is provided by uh, Andrei uh, Zorin who says that uh, since uh, 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 Russia considered herself as a single heir to the Byzantine uh, church, uh, they felt entitled to the classical heritage of uh, 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 the ancient Greek uh, culture. But I would uh, reformulate it a, uh, in, a, in a broader manner and say that since Russia considered herself as the heir of the Byzantine uh, Empire, the Eastern Empire, that would entitle Russia to become uh, or to be the inheritor of the uh, classical uh, legacy. And, uh, uh, and just one uh, word which is related to Professor Lidov's uh, uh, speech that uh, this uh, uh, restoration of the ancient culture on its uh, ancient places, that it's ancient classical culture, probably comes from the correspondence of Voltaire with uh, uh, Catherine uh, the Great, who, uh, so, uh, who wanted to see just the classical heritage of the Byzantine Empire, but not uh, to see, uh, so to say, uh, Eastern Christianity or the role Eastern Christianity played uh, in it. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, can I ask uh, a, a question? It's, uh, it relates to uh, the part of your talk where you mentioned the um, a cult of Constantine the Great that comes around in the middle of the 17th century. And I was just wondering, does that, would, would, would that mean that we can expect, for example, in icons, more presentations of uh, Constantine the Great? Do you have this sort of iconography of Constantine and his mother uh, with the true cross and all that? Do you see more of that? Uh, <clears throat> iconography coming yes, up? There, are, there is a so-called Constantine cross, uh, oh. which is a special cross which we can discover in Ukrainian uh, in, engravings in the second time of the 17th century. And I deliberately left uh, something uh, to the end, and this is here. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an etching uh, which was done by Peter the Great during uh, uh, his uh, great embassy in uh, Western Europe with the help of a, a Dutch engraver, uh, Schonenbeck, but probably we should reformulate that it was Schonenbeck, the engraver who did this uh, etching and, and Peter, Peter assisted uh, him in one way uh, or another. And what is interesting, uh, what is interesting here, uh, of course, that uh, it, this, is the, uh, this is the mixture of two iconography. Uh, it is, uh, uh, it, is, it is called the allegory of uh, uh, Christianity over uh, the Islam. 
But it's very interesting that the whole concept goes back to the book of uh, the one uh, passage of the book of in the book of uh, Revelation, and uh, this is not my uh, this is not due to my research, but uh, uh, due to Robert Collis who uh, discovered it, and because it is written that uh, uh, a great sign appeared in heaven: a woman clothed with the sun, uh, with the moon under her feet and the two wings of the great eagle were given to the women. The, the two, great, uh, two wings of the great eagle, of course, the representation of uh, Russia, and you can see the moon uh, on the, uh, the, uh, her feet. Also, very close, there are uh, uh, Ottoman banners with the stars and the crescent uh, on it, and with the crescent on the top of the, uh, on the, top of the banners. But I am saying that it is a fusion of two iconography uh, because the Constantine theme clearly appears because there is the uh, cross in the sun, yeah. the cross uh, in the sun, which is clearly one uh, aspect and one motive of the uh, Constantine uh, legacy. And as I mentioned, that uh, uh, in, this shine, in this sign you shall win even appeared on Peter's banners in uh, 1711. Are there any more comments, Wait, questions? Uh, yes, please, Professor. Uh, I would like to add uh, uh, several mm -hmm. tesserae to your mosaic. Um, one is the memorandum written by Field Marshal Munich before when he was returned from his exile uh, at the very beginning of Catherine the Great's uh, reign, uh, in which he stated that uh, taking Constantinople has always been the the goal of the of the Peter the Great's uh, foreign policy, um, and another another uh, much less known uh, approach is the I would say the angle from from below. Um, I would like to draw your attention to the um, memories. Well, the, uh, I don't know sketches by the Russian pilgrim to Constantinople, well then to holy places, but uh, what is important for us um, is Constantinople by the Moscovite priest, a very rank and file uh, priest, Ivan Lukyanov. Mm, it's a highly interesting, hilariously funny text, very vivid, um, in which he um, tells about his encounters in Constantinople with the Greeks, uh, with, the, uh, with, the, with the patriarch, with the uh, abbots of monasteries, with monks, with regular Greeks, in which all Greeks ask him, uh, uh, of course, as a representative of, of Russia, why uh, Russia is not liberating us, why you are not taking us finally uh, and, and liberate us from the Turks. And he invariably feels uh, somehow insulted and says, uh, don't mix up different things. Uh, our Tsar is a Moscovite Tsar, and you have had your own Tsar, but you lost him. And now don't complain. Uh, your, your affairs is not our affairs. It's very interesting, and I highly recommend it to you. Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, detail. And, and it's, I think it's from the period uh, when, the, it, it, before the self perception of. It Russia. was, uh, he, he visited Constantinople in 1702. 17, still, still, yeah. still lingered on. Still, uh -huh. yeah. Quite a hard-hearted reaction. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyone else who would like to make a comment, or shall we say thank you to Andre? Thank you very much for your interest. Thanks for your attention. Uh, and now we're going to move to uh, our next speaker, who is uh, the last speaker for for today. Uh, Vladimir Tsvetkovich, who is a research associate professor at the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory at the University of Belgrade. He has held research and teaching positions all over Europe, including Denmark, Scotland, Norway, Serbia, and so on. Uh, his research interests include patristics, ancient and Byzantine philosophy, and modern orthodox thought. Um, I would like to read to you, uh, I've just chosen some of his publications. Uh, these are uh, books that have come out recently. Uh, Justin Popovich, Synthesis of Tradition and Innovation. This came out in Serbian in 2021. And uh, 
two years before, thought and mission of St. Justin Popovich. And the book which you saw in the room next door while uh, we were having our lunch, uh, From Merciful Angel to Fortress Europe, The Perception of Europe and the West in Contemporary Serbian Orthodoxy, which was published in 2015. I imagine it has to do also with the context of the refugee crisis at the time. So uh, please, oh, Vladimir. Thank you, thank you, Tamana. Thank you also for the invitation to present uh, uh, my, well, this is not a, a research which I am uh, working, but this is an over overview of Byzantinism or Byzantium, perception of Byzantium in modern uh, Orthodox, Serbian Orthodox theology. Let me, the most of the uh, early modern period, the Serbian people lived in two empires, the Ottoman and the Habsburg Empire. The Serbian church, which gained autocephaly from the Byzantine emperor under the Serbian nobleman and its first archbishop, Sava Nemanić, in 1219, and was elevated to the level of the Patriarchate in 1346, had a very turbulent uh, period during the modern era. After the fall of medieval Serbia under the Ottoman rule in 1459, the Serbian Patriarchate in Page was abolished in 14. 61. The restoration of the Patriarch occurred in 1557 under, under Patriarch Makarija Sokolovic, a close kinsman of the Ottoman Grand Vezir Mehmed Sokolovic, who unified more than 40 dioceses. The Patriarchate of Page was abolished for the second time by the Ottoman Sultan in 1766, and the Serbian Christians in the Ottoman Empire were again subjected to the spiritual and legal rule of the Greek Patriarch in Fanar in Istanbul, known as Rum Milet. The previously united canonical territories of the Patriarch of Page were dispersed among several jurisdictions. The Serbian Metropolitan of Karlovci, uh, established in 1690 and elevated to the rank of the Patriarchate in 1848, claimed continuity with the abolished Patriarchate of Page. The Serbian Metropolitanate of Montenegro was established in 1766 and remained independent from the Ottoman Empire until the restoration of the Patriarchate of Page in 1920. The Metropolitan of Montenegro also claimed continuity with the Patriarchate of Page and bore the title Exarch of Patriarchal Throne. The Church of Serbia was under the jurisdiction of Constantinopolitan Patriarch until 1832, when Serbia gained a certain level of independence from the sublime port. The Serbian Diocese of Dalmatia and Kotor gained the independence from Fanar in 1828 and 8070 respectively, while the Serbian church in Bosnia remained under Fanario rule until 1878 when Bosnia and Herzegovina was occupied by the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Byzant, uh, Byzantium and Byzantine heritage was differently uh, perceived in different jurisdictions. On the territory under Constantinopolitan jurisdiction where Serbs lived, Byzantinism was identify, identified with spiritual and legal rule of the Constantinopolitan Patriarch and the Greek Fenariot bishops, characterized by corruption, simony, Greek racial exclusivism at the expense of Serbian and Slavonic tradition and the loyalty and servitude to the sublime port. At that time, the patriarchs in, Istanbul were being patriarchs in Istanbul were being changed on a daily basis due to simony and intrigue and the preoccupation of the Constantinopolitan patriarch as well as the Asian patriarchs of East, uh, that is, Alexandria Antico in Jerusalem, who all resided in Istanbul, was not the well-being of their flock, but the maintaining their privileged privilege status by paying to Sultan. The fears Competition was not only uh, for the patriarchal throne, but also for local cathedra. Whereas, for example, Ottoman governors, Veli Pashas of Bosnia during the 19th century, had an annual salaries of 500 groschen. The Fenoriot Metropolitans of Sarva could obtain over 10,000 groschen a year to threats and blackmail of their Orthodox flock. Therefore, for many Serbian Christians in Bosnia, converting to Islam was the only way to survive. 
The Greek racial exclusivism at the expense of Serbian tra tradition was evident in the liturgical books. For example, most of the Serbian and generally Slavic feasts and services, such as the Saint Great Martyr Lazarus of Kosovo, which we celebrate today, the Saint Cyril and Methodius, were excluded from the calendar and the liturgical books during the reign of Phanariot bishops and replaced with the feasts and services directly connected to Constantinople, such as the protecting veil of Mother of God. Finally, the loyalty and servitude of the Phanariot bishops to Ottoman authorities was, a, was a apparent in their discouragement of every national rebellion against the Ottomans, threatening the Serbian flock with the damnation to hell if they show disobedience to the Sultan. The Fanariot bishops also prevented rebellions by denouncing every conspiracy to Ottoman authorities. In the metropolitanate and later patriarchate of Karlovci, Byzantinism was a synonym for the other constructed on stereotypes and categorization of, quote, the world that lies on the borders of what West sees as its own cultural territory, to borrow the words of uh, Dimitri Angelo. The Caesaropapism and autocracy to which the West perceived both Byzantine and Ottoman legacy, encapsulating them in the term Byzantinism, were also evident in relation between Kaiser and Metropolitanate of Karlovs in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The, Austro-Hungarian authorities were persistent in creating division between the episcopate on one hand and the lower clergy on the other hand in the metropolitanate in order to prevent a serious consolidation of Serbian national community. The only way for the Serbian bishops to preserve the acquired state privileges was to directly oppose the liberation of Slavic people in the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the unification with the already liberated Serbian Montenegro. In spite of the loyalty and servitude of Karlovic patriarchs and bishops to Austro-Hungarian authorities, the Metropolitan developed a number of democratic decision-making practices and institutions, such as committees, council, consistories, courts, and that differentiated them from their counterparts ruling over the former Ottoman regions. Almost a decade after the establishment of the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes in 1980 and the Serbian Patriarch in 1920, the tension of, in the Serbian Episcopate between the former Austro-Hungarian and former Ottoman bishop remained until the later group prevailed. The references to Byzantium and Byzantinism in the theological literature were scarce and negative, usually associated with the Fanariot bishops and their attempt to revive Byzantium. Nevertheless, during the interwar period, perception of Byzantine legacy has changed, especially in the works of two leading theological figures of that period, period namely Nikolai Velimirovic and Justin Popovic. When Velimirovic was elected a bishop of Okrid in 1920, he was a European gentleman with several doctorates from Western universities, and his views on Byzantium were not much different from his Protestant and Catholic colleagues. Moreover, for Velimirovic, Byzantinism was, similarly to Roman Catholicism, a form of ecclesial imperialism directed against the national churches. Due to the vicinity of Ohrid to the Mount Athos, Velimirovic spent his summers in the monastic republic, establishing a strong bond with the Atonite fathers and ascetics, especially with the Siluando Atonite. Asceticism became for Velimirovic the true philosophy, and the Mount Athos became for his the embodiment of Byzantinism and Holy Byzantium. Therefore, Velimirovic this associated Byzantium and Byzantinism from Constantinople or Byzantium and its ecclesial rule and tradition, identifying it along the lines of George Ostrogorsky with the synthesis of Christianity with Greek philosophical and cultural legacy and Roman law institution. For Velimirovic, the first autobishop 
of the autocephalous Serbian church, Saint Sava Nemanić was an example of Byzantinism because he unified Serbian church, state, education, army, family, art, culture, and monasteries in service to God. Veliminović's student, Justin Popovic, was even more categorical in his critique of ecumenical patriarchate, as well as in his view on Byzantine legacy and Byzantinism as theological and ascetical heritage. Two ecumenical patriarchs, Melotius IV, Metaxakis, and Athenagoras Piru were especially in the focus of Popovic's critique for betraying the true spirit of Byzantium revealed in the all-encompassing Orthodox tradition and replacing with a form of political Byzantinism as serving or serving either to Greek nationalism or neo-papal pretensions of Constantinopolitan throne. Popovic path to holy Byzantium or Byzantine spiritual tradition led him to Russian religious philosophy from which he appropriated the ideas of integral or living knowledge, all unity, and theohumanism. In his doctoral thesis from Athens from 19, 1926, Popovich attempted to prove the continuity of idea of integral knowledge in the monastic and ascetic tradition of Byzantine and Christian East particularly with Makarios of Egypt. Popovich baptized the Russian idea of all unity in the patristic tradition of John Chrysostom and Maximus the Confessor, transforming it not in a metaphysical ideal like it was in Vladimir Solovyov, but in a concrete liturgical and Catholic ecclesiality. Finally, Popovich formulated the idea of God-man on the basis of the dogma of Helsedon, regarding the indivisible unity of two nature of Christ, and he opposed it to the modern European humanism. Popovich's two, vol two volumes of the Orthodox dogmatics published by the mid-1930s abounded with the patristic references to Byzantine theological authors, and thus Popovich's long-lasting friend, George Florovsky, considered them as the best Orthodox dogmatic manuals. Popovich contributed immensely to a new orthodox theological movement referred to by Ferovsky's neo-patristic synthesis that perceived Byzantine church father as the norm and criterion for every theological speculation. Similarly to Velimirovich, Popovich perceived Saint Sava as a real heir of Byzantium due to his attempt to implement the Christian philosophy in all spheres of life. Popovich was the crucial figure in transforming the views on Byzantium and Byzantinism in Serbian culture, from negative and politically oriented to positive and spiritually oriented. For Popovich, the spiritual legacy of Byzantium was kept alive in the Balkans and in Russia, while Catholic Protestant Europe has abandoned this legacy, replacing the God-man Christ with man-God merged first in the infallible pope in Rome and then in many infallible men and women across Europe. In spite of severely criticizing the policy of ecumenical patriarchate, especially during the reign of Patriarch Athenagoras, Popovich considered Greeks as godfathers and teachers to Serbs and other Slavs, and his critique of Byzantium or Constantinople aimed to return them to great role they marvelously played over one million in Byzantine Empire. During the 90s, 1960s and 1970s, Popovic sent his spiritual disciples, Atanasi Jevtic, Amphilohi Radovic, Artemi Radosavljevic, and Irina Bulovic to Athens to pursue their doctorates in theology on various topics related to Byzantine tradition. They all took an active role in reviving Greek theology on the principles of Athenian schools whose famous representative were John Zizoulas, Christus Yanaras, Panayotis Nelas, and Nikos Nisiotis. By de being deeply inspired by the Russian emigre theology, this movement promulgated Eucharistic ecclesiology, Christocentric anthropology, theological anti-Westernism, personalism, and the theology of personhood, theocentric humanism, mystical theology and apotheticism, helicentrism and Byzantinism, as well as the insistence on the restoration of monasticism 
and the existence of ontological character of orthodox ethos. The Serbian students propagated the Byzantinism in the form of political theology as a topic of their doctorate show. Athanasi Jevtic called in to question Western biblical literalism by interpreting Pauline epistle through the lens of John Chrysostom exegesis, and Philokhi Radovich opposed Thomist Trinitarian essentialism by proposing Palamite personalism in triadology. Artemi Radosavli challenged Benedictine studies on Maximus Confessor by employing Maximus Christ Christocentrism and ascetical theology, and Irina Ibulovic for the modern Vatican Ostpolitik by portraying the rebuttal of Florentine Union by Marcos Eugenicos of Ephesus. The young Serbian theologians were not helping their colleagues, Greek colleagues, to revive the ideology of Megali Idea by theological means, but the common goal of both Serbian and Greek theologians was to establish Orthodox Christianity as the primary principles of unity with their national cultures, like it has been in the Byzantine culture. This neo-Byzantine network included not only leading Orthodox theologians such as Florovsky, Popovich, Dimitri Stanilai, and John Maidorf, and young theological hopes like Ziziula, Sonia, and Diana Ras, but also famous spiritual elders, such as the elders Pisces, the Atonite, and Aphilochius of Patmos, to whom Amphilochi Radovich was closely associated, Elder Porfirios, a spiritual guide to Rene Bulovic in Athens, as well as young and promising elders, such as Elder Emilianos of Simon Petra. Byzantium or the Constantinopolitan throne played a very insignificant role in this movement until it strengthened its theological position by ordaining the theolo theology professor John Zizoulas as the Metropolitan of Pergamon in 1986. By the beginning of 1990s, the focus of theological Byzantinism was shifted towards eschatology and its dynamic interpretation toward ecclesiological themes such as the place of the episcopal office in the church, the role of monasticism, especially the Atonite in the restoration of church life, and towards liturgical renewal and revelation of the mission. The new theological trends were evident in the interpretation of Cyril Methodian and Saint Savian tradition as continuation of the existing church canonical and political milieu of Byzantine world. Athanasi Eftic pursued the investigation in St. Sava Episcopacy through the lens of bishop centric ecclesiology promoted by G John Zizoulas. Moreover, by claiming that St. Sava theology and ecclesiology originate from the Atonite spiritual experience, yes, Eftic emphasized the significant, uh, significance of Atonite monastic pra practices for reviving church life in post communist Serbia. Thus, in the Eftich vision, St. Sava appeared as a successor of the Cappadocian, Sinaitic, studied ascetic and monastic tradition as, and as a forerunner of Atonite Hesychasm. For Eftich, the center of gravity of the Byzantine legacy was not in Constantinople, but in the Montatus and its spiritual practice. The purpose of Eftich's theological Byzantinism paired with the heritage of St. Sava and, or Svetosavlje was reaffirmation of orthodoxy as a primary principle of unity in the Serbian culture. Uh, by following Bishop Sava, who established the independent Serbian church in order to strengthen Christianity among Serbian people and unity of the medieval state, Serbian state, Bishop Atanasi Jevtic rebuilt the church in Herzegovina during the Yugoslav War of 1990s in order to strengthen Serbian ecclesial identity and Serbian unity in the post-Dayton Bosnia and Herzegovina. The late Metropolitan Amphilochia Radovic of Montenegro played a similar role to Jevtic in strengthening not national unity, but the civic solidarity around the Orthodox Church in his native Montenegro. As a response to Montenegrin President Milo Djukanovic, controversial law on freedom of religion from December 2019, 
which showed to confiscate all Serbian church properties built prior to 1918. The Metropolitanate of Montenegro organized the public prayers and religious procession on a daily basis for several months at the beginning of 2020, which were supported not only by Orthodox believers, but also by Catholics, Muslims, and atheists. Metropolitan and Philohi proposed a university professor Zdravko Krivokapic to be the leader of the opposition party's coalition and invited the church believers and supporters to vote for the, this coalition at the parliamentary election on the, 19, uh, on the 30th of August 2020. The voter turnout was massive and the opposition parties overthrew Djukanovic party from power after 30 years. Finally, the problematic articles about confis confiscation of the Serbian Orthodox Church property in the law of freedom of religion were changed by the Mont Montenegrin parliament. This contribution of the late Metropolitan Amphilochia to the process of building democratic and law-abiding society is also a kind of theological Byzantinism because the church played a role of an initiator of national unity. In spite of proclaiming the spiritual and theological tradition of Byzantium, Popovich disciples exercised a certain reservation in regard to the policy of Constantinopolitan throne especially in regard to organization of Council of Crete 2016 and unilateral proclamation of autocephaly of the new Ukrainian church consisting of unrepentant schismatics. In conclusion, Serbian theological perception of Byzantium drastically changed during the course of 20th century from negative to positive. However, the Serbian theologians and churchmen considered as a true hero of Byzantine tradition, not the ecclesial policy of Constantinopolitan throne, but the spiritual practice of Athenite monastic republic. This shift in perception allowed the three generations of Serbian theologians to develop together with some of, of their great colleagues a form of theological Byzantinism, which propagated Orthodox Christianity as a primary principle of unity with the national cultures often previously reduced to Greek nationalism and Constantinopolitan primacy, Byzantinism thus became a much wider principle seeking to secure unity of people from the Adriatic Sea to the Pacific and from the Arctic Ocean to the Mediterranean in Orthodox Christianity. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Vladimir. I, I think it was great to have a perspective, you know, from Serbia, because it just shows the, the variety of traditions you have in modern orthodoxy. You know, I'm mostly familiar with Russian religious philosophy. I know a bit, and I think most people have heard a bit about Greek, uh, you know, perspectives. We know much less. Uh, you know about Serbia and it's interesting to see how you have these figures like uh, 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 Justin, Justin is that how Justin Popovich, yeah. yes uh, who uh, was borrowing from the Russians but he was also connected to uh, to the Greeks like Yanaras and Zizoulas and so on so I thought that this was great and uh, very interesting and now I think that if we do end up with a lexicon we're going to include your uh, theological Byzantinism I like that <laughs> any comments or questions I have a question. Um, it, it's, it's very useful to see the, the view from Serbia for the Ottoman period. And um, I was wondering, before the, the Fanariots became a malice, um, and, and after that, what was, did the attitude of the Serbians and the Serbian church, the Serbian, um, ecclesiastical core uh, have toward the other Orthodox non-Greeks within the Roman Milet. Um, um. Was that, I mean, is there any theological reflection? Is there any ecclesiastical reflection? Yeah, you're talking about like, a, like what was it, 16th century, 17th century, or? I mean, through the, through the whole period mm -hmm. until the uh, Serbia became 
in, independent yeah. from the well, other. But I, I don't think that there was it because the, the, there was a very first, there was no any theological learning. That was during the patriarchates, and then they could reflect about this. Mm -hmm. Uh, when it was like during the Montenegro, like metropolitan, they play a very uh, significant role, but they were kind of very tiny and they were dependent of Russian. Uh, what about the patriarchate of Pech, which? Well, the, the patriarchate of Pech, when, uh, when, when you're talking about uh, patri like the uh, during the existence of patriarch yes. of Pech, well, I don't think that they, they consider, because as you can see on the first, they cover the whole territories of, uh, when you go, for example, they, they consider themselves being, being uh, for example, here, how big is this? And then you see that, that actually moving down uh, a Serbian church, and they were kind of uh, having a, a lot of uh, different, uh, uh, different uh, Orthodox people under their rule like uh, that was a, but not all of them i mean no, the, the, no, the, no, but they they thought that they played the same role in the austro hungarian empire or uh, at least this uh, because at that time it was kind of two millets there was kind of room millet and there was a great serbian military kind of connection and there was a clear connection with the, the with Mehmet mm -hmm. who actually established it and they actually it, i think that it was a rivalry role with the byzantine uh, 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 ecumenical patriarchate, and they thought that maybe they are doing. Different thing is because normally all the books it was Slavonic. What they did, and they actually had a, a much uh, stronger capacity for union with the Slavs, Balkan Slavs, and at that time most of the liturgi like liturgical uh, language of Romanians were also Slavonic. And that it was uh, good for them to play on this card, but this is all dream of uh, Dush, Tsar Dushan, who all wanted to be, become like a Byzantine emperor. So, but there wasn't any sense of solidarity with the Bulgarians or the Romanians or, or even the well, Orthodox Albanians. Yeah, but, but at that time, I don't think that there was kind of a sort of that kind of national consciousness. There was strict, uh, I mean, uh, because that's, normally that's you can you can track like in this national consciousness from 18th century Austro-Hungarian Empire, and then there was this kind of alliance with Romanians. But the problem with Romanians is that they didn't want to ally with with the Serbs. They wanted their own national liberation from, uh, and therefore this there, is this there, movement. There is, there is difference. There is a difference between the national um, ideology and ethnic um, identity. Uh, which was never lost completely within the Ottoman Empire, as much as there was the leading identity was Christian, which is Orthodox, but still there are... The liturgical are language is the same, the Slavonic. And Greek. Yeah, of course, of course, but I'm talking about this because normally if you don't see, you see kind yeah. of Greeks okay. as, as the rivals, and other that they were more on your side because you can approach them through the language. Okay, this yeah, looks you. to me like the beginning of a very interesting discussion which can continue over dinner. <laughs> and for now, I'd like to say thank you to all of you. I think that um, at first glance, what I think strikes me from, from the whole day today is that on the one hand, there's so much diversity, you know, including people co coming from different countries, working on different material, different disciplines, the topics. I think there was a huge variety of topics. And on the other hand, I see so many interesting crossovers. You know, I did get an idea when I got the abstracts at the beginning that obviously there would be such crossovers, but I think that in the process of actually listening to, to the papers, I see that these interconnections became so much richer and interesting, and I think that there were also quite a lot of unexpected ideas and connections. And in a way, for me, this was one of the most interesting things coming coming out of it. I felt like I learned a lot. I'm very happy uh, myself. Uh, I also didn't, uh, you know, I didn't contribute anything. I was just listening to you. I thought it was great. So if anyone wants to say anything about what, what you found interesting, any ideas you would like to think us to think about, uh, you know, 
in the next several months, which we can then uh, discuss again, and also with people who are part of, uh, of our online audience. Um, please, you can share them now. Well, uh, I would like to say that, well, you, you proved that your idea and the concept of this seminar is quite fruitful and in my view it should become a regular event. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm very uh, pleased to be yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I, I, I don't see any uh, analogies in, in other countries. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, Byzantine we'll, we'll heritage and Eurasia and well, it, it works. As an approach, it works. And there are a lot of people who, who are interested in it. And, and it's also very important that we are doing this in Vienna, but not in Moscow or in Belgrade or Sofia, where always there are some, you know, national politics and things like this. So it's, it's important to have a panoramic view on, to, to see the whole picture. Yes. So, and I'll, I'll think about that. It seems to me like uh, a very good idea. And it also has to do in a way with what we try to, to achieve at the, the Eurasia program, which is very much about creating a network of like-minded people who are interested in similar questions. And, approach them from completely different perspectives, but also find, you know, ways in which your research can actually contribute as an art historian to Professor uh, Ivanov's research as a historian and uh, mm -hmm. Professor Izmir Lieva's work as a literary specialist and so on. So uh, I'll think about that. And so it's unique, unique academic space you created with our help, but mostly, mostly uh, yourself. Uh, and it's, it's important because it's not so often. You, you made a kind of know-how. Well, you know, I, I'm very grateful to all of you for agreeing to actually come and, you know, to Adrian and Ivan who uh, participated from, from France, I think, it worked very well, and as you say, I think so many ideas came up that it really makes sense to do this uh, again. Uh, I don't know if we'll be able to have it as a regular event, but I think let's think of uh, a next meeting at some point. <laughs> that would be nice. So, um, does anyone else want to add anything? Or will uh, continue? Oh, Ivan, yeah. Yes, please do. This is the hard part of being uh, online. <laughs> um, sorry. No, this is just uh, what, what I find also interesting. And this is maybe something which should really go beyond. Uh, last year, or two years ago, before Corona, we organized in Venice an event uh, with Armin Begmeier, which was called Demarginalizing Byzantium. And the idea of this, this meeting was to talk with many young scholars. So I was the oldest at this meeting about um, what to do to go out of the trap of Byzantine studies, which are objectively marginalized. There are less and less chairs of Byzantine. There are less and less people working on Byzantine. And uh, well, there are many hypotheses why, why this is happening. So one of them is that Byzantium was interesting during the Cold War as the Alter Russia, while now Islamic studies are much more popular because this is the enemy of the United States and so on. But um, what we find out is that one of the main problems of what is called Byzantine studies, and I, I'm one of these who, are, I mean, in Byzantium or democracy, we wrote that we are not using Byzantium anymore. We are using the Empire of Constantinople, so we are back to the 17th century. Anyhow, one of the problems is that we are speaking about a deeply transdisciplinary community. And this was clearly visible today. I mean, we were around the table virtually from five or six different fields. Now, what is the problem? Is that if you have a field which is ontologically interdisciplinary, this is a problem because there are no transdisciplinary positions. 
And this is creating a real lack of, of, of solidity within the movement. And I feel it as a real problem of the so-called Byzantine studies, because they are divided in too many different fields. And thus to imagine a space, a shared space, which is um, interdisciplinary is something which, which can bring new life to the, to the field, which otherwise is marginalized and I'm afraid disappearing. I mean, this is of a certain interest into the, let's say, ex-Byzantine countries to follow what Charles Deal was writing in 1900, right? So this is a bit time ago. But um, for the Latin West, uh, the field is disappearing. This, I, I believe, is really the reality. I don't know if in history is so terrible as in art history, but in art history, there is today not a single chair of Byzantine which would probably exist in Germany. And uh, do not speak about Switzerland. We lost in Switzerland two chairs of Byzantine in 15 years. The two only which were existing in Switzerland, by the way. So this is just to say that something is really happening. And um, to imagine a network of Byzantine, so-called Byzantine, beyond the borders of, um, of the fields is something which is, I believe, one of the unique possibility to maintain the field of research. Otherwise, into the Latin West, Byzantium will I, I'm afraid it disappear progressively. Okay, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for, 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 for this insight. I think it's quite pessimistic on the one hand, but it also <laughs> means that it, it just forces people in the field to actually rethink how they're doing things. And to, you know, I think I quite agree with what you say, Ivan, and I think that it seems to me that one of the problems is that also Byzantinists are seen from the outside as being, on the one hand, too dis interdisciplinary, on the other hand, too, too conservative. So one thing is probably very, very good in a present day perspective. They always ask you to do interdisciplinary things, but it's certainly not good to be seen as very conservative and not wanting, not being open to transforming your, your methods, the way you're doing things. And that's why I think what you say is quite interesting because it goes to the heart of Byzantine studies nowadays, that you're doing something which is by definition an interdisciplinary field, but you have to be also open to rethinking it and presenting it in, in a new innovative way. So, yeah. Well, um, is there anyone else who would say, who would like to add to that? I'm not sure that I have a coherent thing to say, but, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, but I was thinking that um, I understand that most of you are Byzantinists, so it is important to have the Byzantine label in, um, in, in the heading of, of the events. Uh, I also understand that Eurasia is important because this is the program, so uh, you are operating within certain limitations. Uh, but I was wondering whether um, certain other possibilities exist that can incorporate both elements but open it up a little bit more. Uh, one thing that is very dear to my heart is the idea of the varieties of orthodox experience, uh, which has been so artificially homogenated in um, different academic pursuits. Uh, what you have as um, a quintessential orthodox experience is either the Byzantine or the Russian, um, and all the other versions of orthodox culture are lost in between. Um, so something for a next meeting or a meeting after that uh, that will address this on the, without, without losing the Byzantine and using Eurasia as a shared space mm -hmm. where we can see the interaction and competitions and conflicts among these different orthodox orthodoxies uh, or Eastern Christianities. Um, and the other thing that I was would like to see at some point happening is to look at Holy Land as um, 
as another imaginary that has been reinvented and the different um, mythologies and competitions um, that, that meet and clash there, uh, which, which falls within the Eurasian um, purview and can incorporate Byzantium, but can incorporate other empires, in, including the Soviets and including the, the present day. So just two okay. Okay. very incoherent ideas at the end. No, of but the I, think, I think they're great ideas, and I think we should all, not just me <laughs> as an organizer, I think we should all try to think through these ideas, what Ivan just said and uh, what Valentina said, and try to think of a next meeting which hopefully will not take as many years to organize. As you see, while I was organizing the conference, uh, Ivan got promoted, the two of them went, Adrian published a new book, you know, people are producing things and so on. So next time, hopefully, it will, uh, the, the situation won't be as dramatic, you know. And I think that all of us should actually try to, to think and uh, come up with ideas of how to formulate another day like that, which builds on some of the interesting things that happened today, but also present everything in a, in a slightly different way. Clementa, I have a very interesting new piece of information for you. Okay. The other day, I was having lunch with the most prominent uh, Viennese uh, Byzantinist, uh, Professor Claudia Rapp, mm -hmm. um, and she told me that uh, the Byzantine Institute um, in Vienna just got a huge grant for many years from the Austrian Academy. Guess what? Guess what the topic? Byzantium and Eurasia. Really? <laughs> exactly. Wow, I, we see they stole the idea from us because... <laughs> they you claim the copyright. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Ide ideas are floating in the air somehow. No, but this is great because I think that next time when we have something, we can actually co-organize with them. Mm -hmm. I'm very eager to co-organize because, mm -hmm. you know, otherwise I end up doing a lot of work. <laughs> I want to co-organize. Uh, so, yeah, it's good to know, but it also shows that you know, there's interest in the topic, as Professor Lidov said, you know, uh, you know, not that that much has been done about it, so it's sort of, it's interesting, but at the same time, you see that recently, there are people who, who start working institutions and so on. So I think that this is great. Okay, I think we should finish now. Uh, I don't want that, I don't think that, hey, Ivan, Adrian, bye-bye. Bye, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>